I'm uh, about to go through changes, but I'm doing all right. Did, is it because you ate something? I don't know. We'll find it. Eating, eating, smoking. He ate two chocolates, and we got some liquid acid on sugar cubes he might have to eat later. That's awesome. Look at this shit. We got this fucking liquid acid. We got the box of sugar cubes. I never fucking since I was a kid. Can you we did something where it was like shit? transdermal. Yeah, and you put it on your skin. That's the same. All this shit is like fucking cutting edge now. These young kids. This Where shit's fucking this? crazy. They brought it to a show. This guy comes to my shows every ninety Have you days. Tried it before? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, he brings me chocolate covered mushrooms with THC chocolate. Fuck you. He grinds down the mushrooms. I, I don't know where I, I like. I, I you can't talk about this online. <laughs> the fuck, up, Joey. This Lee, get him in control. This guy grinds up the mushrooms, gets the chocolate, puts the THC in it, and it's like a chocolate mushroom. No, 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 no. You, <laughs> these young college kids now—they're about to change the fucking Did world. Did you have a sugar cube, Lee? Not tonight. Not tonight. I've had about what four, four sugar cubes. Yeah, we had a couple. couple you know what I always thought was the bummer about acid was that you like. If I if I'm planning a weekend, say, and I go, well, Friday night's coming, I'd like to get high on acid, and but then also Saturday is right behind it, and I want to get high on acid. You got to take a half a hit, like a, a blotter acid, and then you got to take a hit or a hit and a half just to get off on it, and it's never as good. You feel dopey with it, right? I got blotter too. Joey's never taken <laughs> half. <of it. laughs> Start this fucking thing. We got everything. That's we can even put a drop on the blotter. That's yeah, what we can double gonna, up. That's what now, we do you do any of the microdosing, like Duncan? I can't find it. Like well, he says, he says, like, if you got that and say it's 100 cc's, 100 or milligrams right, or whatever, right. right? He says, so then you cut it in force and take a quarter hit every day or something like that. And so, like, that's how you, you want to know how much your acid is dosed. But, like, and then you get, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, Lee, the that's people, the Everybody's talking week. about all that kind no, of no, shit. No, no, I, I think it's a little bit less than a quarter. I think it's, like, supposed to be, like, almost nothing. It depends on your shit, but, like, 12 and a half milligrams to 20, no more than 25 milligrams. Tate, we had, like, what, 500 tonight, something like that? We don't have 5 milligrams. We do. We go deep, Tate. We we went like no 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 I mean of acid oh of acid oh, okay. yeah CCs and shit Lee's, he tells me when he gives them to me Lee's already lost oh yeah he's he's going through changes well, he said Miller who knows anyways this show is brought to you by this show is presented by on it the church of what's happening now is brought to you by Zeal and I can't guys I can't tell you how much I love Zeal it was my first massage. It was the best experience I could have hoped for. Go check them out, zeal.com, or they have an iPhone and Android app, and it's zeal, Z-E-E-L. And when you go to zeal.com, add, click add promo code and enter code CHURCH, and you get $25 off of your first massage. That's zeal.com, promo code CHURCH to get $25 off. Bidets are back. The church of what's happening now, and Lee Sai and myself, I'm very proud to introduce you to hellotushy.com. HelloTushy.com makes portable devices. You could bring this on the road with you if you wanted to, and I would recommend it. Go to HelloTushy.com, get these portable devices that spray your butt clean with water. Whoa. When you go to HelloTushy.com slash church, you get 10% off of your order. That's HelloTushy.com slash church. I might need one of those. You do. Come by the house. I got an extra one for you. Awesome. Here we go, cocksuckers. Crank that little Puerto Rican. Where's Trump? Oh shit. Wednesday, March 1st. Here we go, cocksuckers. Get those fucking cockroach killers on the Puerto Ricans are coming oh shit church of what's happening now my man Tate Fletcher my little Jewish goomba Lee Syatt and your uncle Joey bitches
Stabbing you bad motherfuckers. Uncle Joey here on a ho-hum Wednesday night, Thursday morning. Welcoming you to Podcastville. My main man Tate and little Lee over there fucking going through changes already and shit. The show Luna. hasn't even kicked in yet. Those La Luna's getting me. Yeah, La I can tell those La Luna's getting you because you don't <laughs> need them at the house. You know what this motherfucker oh, does? God, I'm, he I'm, does I a periscope on the weekend. Tate, hold me back right now. I go, Lee, don't <laughs> hold fuck. me back. I go, Lee, don't fuck around. <laughs> Train on the weekends. Eat these edibles on the weekends and you come on the show and we go deep. You don't get fucked up. So he goes online. And I can see him that he's eating the chocolates, but he's not making faces. When he eats chocolate, he don't like chocolate. So if he eats chocolate, he'll make a face, and the THC, he'll start. When he's at home, he eats the chocolate. I watch him on Periscope, and he's joking around. I'm like, something ain't right. No, I know you. So I was looking at him the other day, and what he does is he gets a Hershey bar, and he cuts it down the middle, and he opens the bag. It's reclosable. I'm going to sue you for slander. And he puts it in there, and then he eats it in front of these young kids, and they're like, oh, well, he's going How deep. How dare you? But he ain't going deep. He eats three stars and gives his girlfriend three stars. How like dare star. you? And then that's the end of the fucking night. And he tells everybody he's eating 12, 1500. He ain't doing that. He's eating 300 and two Hershey bars. First of all, I'm going to have to start doing it at the dispensary to, to clear my name. I go in there. I have not once pulled a fast one. That, that's, that's, that's your level. That's what you were saying earlier with the, with the labels. That I is what I'm saying. I started it. I'm not mad at you for doing it. I'm just saying that. I would never that's do that. That's why you almost got sick before. Yeah, I heard we, we ate the first piece of chocolate. You're gagging. <laughs> You it's kind of like saying you're a Navy SEAL if you're not a Navy SEAL. What do you mean? Saying that you're eating that much, but you're not really. That's I, yeah, he's he's like because then he comes here on that, Mondays. That the problem? That's, yeah. He comes here on Mondays. I give him chocolate. He breaks apart. He's sweating. He's turning red. So he's doing something funny at home with the chocolate. It might not be Hershey's. What's going on at the chocolate at home? Nothing's going on with the at here. If you guys watch the periscopes. <laughs> Joey, if I, I get like 26 seconds to eat the edibles because I don't know if Joey chews them. He just is able to swallow them whole. I can't do that. I have to chew. If you watch on the Periscope, I don't let it touch my tongue because I hate the taste. So I chew it and I keep it and I do it real slow. It takes about two minutes and I do it fine. But here, that's why I puked that one time because you were just like, swallow it. <laughs> and I tried to swallow an entire chocolate bar like all chewed up in my mouth and I puked. All right. We got to watch it from now on the Periscope. From now on, you got to show you? the brand. I always show the brand. I'm, I'm sure if you, we look at the it's old like, ones, you want to see Hershey's kisses. And it's shit. like when you cheek one of your pills when you're in the psych ward. I I, I have no experience with that. But I, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure I would. Jesus Christ, he, he used to take labels and switch them on me, and then and then not even I that. I believe you. I'm the cheap of shoes. Yeah. Not even just the labels. Hilarious. I'm sure I asked him every time. He, I'm sure you just made it up. He at a certain point he just stopped telling me he'd be like what it has don't don't worry about that he, like he would just start lying eventually like, he, he he wouldn't even lie at the end he would just say they used to get they used to have two types of stuff <sighs> they used to have these one and i can't remember now because it's been like a year one time i had ari coming out and even right. ari intelligent israel the whole thing he said I'm <laughs> intelligent <laughs> israel yeah the whole thing you I'm know gonna, i'm gonna yeah. be watching you i don't trust you so i went over to the store and what i did was they had regular chocolate, regular stars for like 125 milligrams, but they had rock candy that was the same company, but only 25 milligrams. <laughs> so I took the rock candy out of the rock candy bag and put the stars in there. So even after Ari came to me and said, let me look at it, and he read it, and I'm like, he's going to catch that it's hard rock candy. He didn't catch it. He goes, okay, I'll eat one. They're only 25 He got so milligrams. fixated on the milligrams. That's on all he saw. That's all he saw. So... Then I took him deep. Him. That's why you're a wizard. You're I like used, a warlock. I used to give him 180 milligram Chiba Chews, but I'd take the label and put 70 on it and just give him half. So he thought he was eating 35, but he was really eating 90. Why fuck with that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know, Lee, if he says I keep eating, he's going to get nervous on the milligram. Because he's got his head tripping himself. People getting, yeah. So you use your warlock skills to do like... Uh, you do like situational blindness on people sure so you can help them sure yeah you're you're I, welcome i appreciate it now i can do 1500 and I, do, I, I have never once stolen valor like that like that those terrible stolen people stolen valor <laughs> stolen <laughs> weed valor that's what it's called have you ever had that at your jujitsu school 
What's that? Like someone coming in pretending to be a black belt? No, it's 100% solvable in about 30 seconds. Right, I've seen videos of it. It's crazy. Right, you just know. I mean, it's like there's no lies on the mat. It's what it is. Why know? would somebody come in and do something like it's that? It's weird. People are misguided. They don't know anything. There's a guy I was training with this morning, and he was uh, he was uh, uh, just drop, drop in, wanted to be around certain guys or there, whatever. And he... I was like, oh, this is how. The- oh, and I, I'm wearing a gi. Like I hadn't had a gi on in eight, I don't know, eight years, long time, and uh, so I just got a gi on and my my Hawaiian board shorts, and, um, and no belt. And he said, so whatever. And and I said, oh, sure, I'll drill with you. And I was like, well, this I want you to tuck your knee up in here. More. No, no, yeah, I got it. And he's one of those I got it guys. And you can tell when you feel with somebody that you you go, oh, they don't have any experience, you know. They're and which isn't a bad thing. It's just what it is. But the bad thing is when I'm so fucked up that I got to pretend like I have some experience. You know, you can pretend you're a kickboxer. Maybe you're great on mitts or whatever, but you don't know what it's like to be in a scrap. And that's cool too. Whatever, whatever. But like, you can't hide from jujitsu. You know what I mean? It's like. Cause you're gonna get strangled, or people will know. And, and I, I don't know what I don't know in this day and age what it is that makes people go, "Yeah, I'm gonna pretend some shit." There's some guys at Eddie's. There's a dude that pretended he was a yes. purple belt or right. something before he was, he was or belt. something like right, that, right. and he never even gotten a blue or something like that. But you know, the kid had an aptitude. He was good. He'd stuck with it, but he just wanted to be better than he was, which I always thought was a little silly. About like, why are you chasing a belt? Why Why aren't you just here in the art of it? Like who give a fuck what belt that is? Like yeah, I don't, I don't care at all. Like I don't, I don't know. It's it's a trip, you know. To have that as the goal, as opposed to I want to be healthy. I want to be able to defend myself. I want to be able to move around. I want to be able to be with my pals every day. And to need a like that kind of reinforcement, like I need to have be in the rankings. Is, is it kind of feels like uh, you're fucking six? Yeah, it feels like you're a little kid. You're trying Did to be a you little train kid. at that uh, stunt. Play. Yeah, yeah, down at eighty seven. Now, where is this? Uh, down in Inglewood. And he has, they have like an art. Now, they shoot movies there and stuff, right? Well, they shoot like previses and. Um, what is it? The John Wick out. people? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I know he works. Yeah, they do there. the. Uh, they've done all the really big action movies. Like, they do a lot of, lot of the uh, action choreography for that. Shoot previses, all the gun work and stuff for John Wick, Deadpool, like all that type shit. I heard John Wick was, just, and the second one too was just amazing. I heard it at, like it's phenomenal. I heard Keanu was great. Like, because I've, I've seen some of the tremendous. trailers. You know the difference, Lee, is that you see a guy like who's the guy that's 106 years old that was fighting wolves, and then his daughter got kidnapped. Oh, Liam Neeson. Taken. Yeah. Yeah, and so you see a, a, a simple. Jump over the fence, Lee, <laughs> Liam, <laughs> and it's like his feet, his head, his waist, the fence, the, and it's a hundred different little video montages to make it appear as if a 75-year-old man is actually getting over a 12-foot fence. It's not happening, but with Keanu, Keanu moves like that, like he's an athlete, and uh, and that's a lot of the reason why that looks so good in there. I mean, they're the best choreographers too they're fantastic man um and they got great stuntmen that are in all those like just legends and 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 beautiful performers top to bottom like those guys like but that's that's the difference i think is like you got a guy that can actually do the bit you know you get a Chris semsworth or a or a, a keanu reeves or something like that that can act. tom cruise he does all his own shit it looks great his uh, shit looks I'm great fucking, what's that movie that with jamie fox Oh the, oh, the driving one, the taxi he was, one. He was yes. very good, dude. He was like, "There's times I watch those movies and I go, oh, you know what? Say what you want to say about Tom Cruise. He's great. He's he was. Fantastic. I just watched Jack Breacher on the flight, and was an Academy Award winner. But I love him. Entertaining. I love him to death. So yeah. I, I watch him. What was I the like sci-fi one where he like kept having the same day over and over again? Vanilla Vanilla Sky. No, no, no. That no. was a good movie. It wasn't that what one. About it? the one where they looked into his mind about the cops. Oh yeah. Uh, Minority, Minority report. report. Yeah, that was great. That's where we're almost living. A couple more weeks, we'll be right there. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. T- like, t- have you ever thought about, like, uh, do you want to expand in acting? Because you've done all uh, these roles with so, such no. amazing actors. I can imagine, like, you you must have learned so much from all the like all How the many movies now? I don't know, like 30 or 40 or something. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, no, I just want to stay there. I was going to give an Eddie Bravo answer. No, like, he loves to live troll. Who loves to live troll more than Eddie? He's, uh, but, yeah, of course, man, of course. Have you, like, how much? Like, um, I take classes, and I, I do all that, and I tr- work out for a lot of things. I'm in a thing, uh, 
me and Danny Trejo got a little piece this weekend coming up, and then uh, Ross and Thurber Marshall's a dude that did a movie. We we were the Millers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that, right? And uh, he'd met me on that before, and then he then that was a long time ago. And he, so I got a little thing on his next piece coming up here. And so it's, I think it's just a lot of word of mouth. It takes time for that. And also I came in as a stunt man, but I look like this. And so I'm not like a nondescript guy. So it's hard for guys to place me in places. So then I had to get good at acting because then you're going to be in roles and you're going to have facial expressions and that, and, and all the, you know, all the, that takes training. And, and so I kind of took to that training like I, took to it with uh, jujitsu or with fights also, you know, and I think that it's, uh, maybe it's a thing that happens, Lee, I hope so, you know, I'd love to be, like, somebody's asking, well, what are your goals with it? And I'm like, well, I'd like to be on a billboard, I'd like to be on the on the poster and have my name be one of the four names that's there, you know, and, and like, I'd, I'd like to do all that, like, that's where I really want it to go, and there's nowhere that I have more fun, is is a lot like fighting when somebody yells action. I think, and that's the other reason. Like, I, you know, I want to spread into it so much that I'm going to do it to however I have to. Um, which also is like I want to go into stand up because that's a way you can kind of force the hand, and I think you get to dictate the role, and you get to perform whenever you want in in a way. And I, and uh, I think it's terrifying. I think it's as scary as going into being a fighter in the octagon or anything else to get on stage. I see guys that do stand up and I see guys that are open micers and it fascinates me with the kind of amount of courage that it takes to really bury yourself. And I think you have to do it with a huge risk. You have to be super real. Cause if you're not super real, those are guys being around the comedy store for all this time. I, I look at guys that have done the same shtick for forever and they've never really risked and they're in the same place they were 10, 15 years ago. And then you see guys at risk and you go, fuck, man. And those guys are all making a million dollars just telling jokes, you know? And and so I, I, I don't know. I really like those aspects of it. And I'm going to try to do that. But if you can help me, I would like that. I, I wish I could. If I, if I could help you, I probably wouldn't be here. But it was uh, like, you're great in all the movies that you're in. But do you think it would be different? Nice do Thank you think you. it'd be different? Do you think it'd be harder if like you had just maybe got not a starring role, but like, a bigger role in a in a in a movie and you had no experience i think it would be worse yeah exactly that's what i'm saying yeah no yeah that's you know it's like that thing that they say uh you know god gives you only what you can handle or something like that like there's all these sayings that are kind of like that and i think it's i think it's like that you think i think you know eddie eddie taught me a lot about like being on, on on a vibe with the universe in a way and like and I think about that a lot and I meditate on that kind of stuff. And I, you know, I try to elevate, you know, people, somebody said, well, what's your mission statement? You do all this different shit. Tate. You got, all, you know, you're getting money six different ways or whatever. And, uh, and I said, well, I want to elevate myself to be the best representation of Tate Fletcher that I can be. So I can be the most useful to the people like my family, friends and community around me, wherever I am. And especially now more than ever with so much darkness in the external world that I want the parts that I can make better. I want to be able to do that. And, and uh, so anyway, that's kind of, yeah, I don't know. I think, and I think also doing stand up, you know, you watch it save people's lives, a lot of people. And, and uh, have you done it yet? No, motherfucker. I'm sorry. Nervous as shit about it. Really? Yeah. Bobby Lee says, I'll have you up the improv on, for five minutes and get ready in a month or whatever. And I was like, fuck. I was hanging out with you guys for a long time and you talk about jujitsu and it mm. used to drive me crazy. Uh, those road trips with six people in the van, I wanted to shoot myself. And I liked you with all my heart, and I liked when Duncan was there, but Red Band at that time was still under the impression, you know, yeah, the one that I gave him blow and he ratted me out. I mean, it was just it was just a world that I had never been involved in. Yeah. But you guys kept talking about jujitsu. And I would go to Eddie's and watch and I would go, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm not I'm not doing that. And then I started watching it, and I became a fan of watching just regular jujitsu online. Marcelo Garcia, um, Lucas Leches. Like, I would just watch this shit. Not when I was coked out, when I was smoking right. weed after that, years later. And it took me two years to actually walk into a jujitsu school. It took me two years to break down how I was going to do this without nobody finding out if I failed. Hmm. Okay, that was the plan. How I could do jujitsu without it getting back to Eddie 
or any of my friends that I even want in there, just in case I don't like it. You know what it's I'm saying? It's weird how that's like a thing. What a fucking shame it was for me to go down there. And I probably went down there for three months before I ever said anything to anybody. Yeah. And then I told Eddie, and he, you know, he was kind of weird. He goes, what do you mean? I go, I've been going over that ski. And I talked to Matt Sarah, and he goes, the first 90 days you want to be in the ski. I was completely lost, you know. When I got out of the prison in Colorado, I could lie to you and tell you, no, I had, my mind was on how I was going to do the next line. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But 3% in that, I was curious about stand-up. I was curious about going back to school and finishing up my nine credits and getting a degree. I had a job already, but something that was lurking inside of me. So I got released in February of 89, okay? Of February of 89. Anybody got a pen? I'm here. February of 89, and this is why I do this. So just to show tape. I got out of jail in February of 89. In January... Of 90, I thought about it, and I scratched it off, like, ah. And then in January of 91, it was snowing, so I had to stay home. And the movie <laughs> and the movie Punchline came on with Tom Hanks and Sally Fields. Yeah. Have you ever watched Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. And that sent me into a tizzy, and I actually called the Comedy Works, and they said, come on down on a Tuesday. And Whoa. that took another month or two. What did you say? Like, I want to be a comic. I like to that? know if you have an open mic. And they said, yeah, we have one every Tuesday night. Just call the Tuesday before and we'll put you on the list for the God, following that's week. That's a hard phone call and to you, make. And you get three minutes. Okay. But from that phone call of January of 91, do you think I actually went down there? No. No. Why would I? Time, yeah. Why would I? But then one day I went to get breakfast. And in April of 91, I saw an ad, a whole section. Roseanne had just busted out of out of Denver. She had just broken up. Denver comedy was booming. Nobody knew where to go. There was only four clubs in the whole state. And they did an article, like in the Rocky Mountain News, in the middle. Like, I, was, I went and walked into a diner and did this just to see the sports section. And it right. landed right in the middle. And it was, do you want to be a stand-up comic? And it had how to become, and it had a course for $31 at the University of Colorado. And it started like a week later. Did you go? Fuck yeah, for $33? Fuck yeah, I went. fuck, Joey. What'd they show you? Just three weeks. Three weeks of... And they say, right, here's... Pick an idea that pops in your head. Yeah. things around it. That's funny to you. But my point being that after that, the guy said... Because the final class, you had to do three minutes on stage. Right. And as I was walking out, the guy goes, come in for a second. He goes, you should try this. You should really maybe try it. You had something up there. And you're like 30 years old, 35 years old. 31, 32. Yeah. I'm an estimator for a roofing company. Really unhappy marriage. That's where you meet Rick Kearns? Uh, About a month later. Really unhappy marriage. Really undecisive. Snorting here and there. Hidden. By this time, it's better to want than to have. My mother had died, and I always craved an American family. And I finally meet a white chick, and they have a family. And I like going up there, and they sat like white people and had dinners, and they prayed. And it was shocking to me, you know, this education. He was a retired colonel, lieutenant colonel from the Air Force. And I don't know. I just, it was better to want than to have at that point. And I acted like an asshole, and we just broke up one day but finally june it's either 18th or 21st is when i went on stage so it basically took me two and a half memory fucking, fucking years. blows me away so it took me to th- either 18th or 21st yeah. time on 1991 yeah. oh yeah we could do Mother this shit fucker. forever so you know i want to explain that to you that fear is a motherfucker. yeah and then if we go back to monday's podcast it's not really fear it's called resistance right it's called resistance. For years, I was trying to write a book. I'd pop up to the book, Lit Lift. But I also have Twitter, Facebook, sure. you know, 
and and then all of a sudden you're on Twitter and somebody sends you a picture of their pussy and you need to jerk off first before you write. Then you need to smoke. Then you need to get some nicotine. Might need a sandwich. And then, you know what? Let me call Tate now and see what he's doing yeah, next yeah, month yeah, for yeah. lunch. It's resistance. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. But with your case, this is a realm that you've been around for over Absolutely. 10 years. So I think it should just be comfortable to you. I think that you should go to a bar open mic and i think you should open up your calendar tomorrow and maybe go to flappers and not say nothing to nobody or i yeah uh, definitely not everybody's like well i want to be there when i go the no that's no, yeah, gonna yeah. happen i just want you to do it do it for yourself the best feeling i have in my life every day is obviously when i kiss my daughter and the feeling i have when i'm at home when i walk out of jujitsu for me for you it might just be a walk in the park it's just something you do when I walk into jiu-jitsu, first of all, when I walk into jiu-jitsu, I know I'm going to go in and, and tap out 18 fucking times. I'm going to have to stop to breathe, but I'm going to sweat. I'm going to mount. I'm going to pass guards. I'm going to get my neck choked. I think that's the resistance in a good way. We're yeah. resistant death and gravity and everything else. Like, that's what that kind of thing that, is, but, you know? But, but yeah, I, I pulled up to Alberto's two times and pulled away. You drove away, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. you know, I yeah. can't lie to nobody here. The same thing. So I get the fear. I get it, but I don't at this point because the best I feel is when I walk out of jujitsu because I dare a motherfucker to come in front of me. I wish I could go from jujitsu to a stand up stage. It would be not very good for people. <laughs> it would not Dude, be very good. Last night you were a fucking monster. I couldn't imagine you bringing more energy to that. Yeah, no. I walk out of that jujitsu oh. with, that, with that last taste of testosterone yeah. running through your body. And you'll say shit a little, little worse than what you're saying. Right. It's a little bit more honest. You give a little less angry. of a fuck. Like oh. the filters are off. I, yeah. I know you can't take like a seven o'clock class right now, but like if you had like a mat in the back and a shower, would that be like the best like role for like an hour? Take a shower, change, go on stage. Oh my god, I would. They couldn't stop me on stage. I would be so fired up. Like and for me, my excitement. Like I never did any of this. So like today, I rolled, we, it was too many people to roll. So all we did was break and pass guards. Right. I think I did six of them, and I passed one purple belts guard. I got in that car like I had won a gold medal Fuck at the Olympics. yeah. Those victories are I, huge. Do you understand me? Yeah. So for me, yeah. if if every time I wrestle with Tate, if he gets me in a spider, a spider guard, but for some reason, I wrestled this time, this eighth time, I went with Tate. And he didn't get me in a spider guard, and he got me in a half guard. I won. In my mind, he didn't get me. I kept my elbows close to my body. Every time he tried to trick me, whatever, I kept him close. All that stuff to me is a win. Where most people wouldn't look at it as a win. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. This time's the first couple of years I went. The first year just where I went. I would only roll one time, five minutes at the end of class. I didn't have the energy. Right. But I would go, today I went. 128 tomorrow i'm gonna go 131 That's and i thing. would let take it on top of me and i would cry <gasps> and i'd be down there breathing fucking thinking the world was gonna end anxiety it panic, feels like that panic. Your chest coming in on you who the fuck should i want to come back yeah. to that the next day yeah i remember walking in there leaving like a will in my car if i die take the car there fucking my so wife funny. because i thought i was gonna die in these classes yeah that's how rough it was for that's me. what it i still think is. about when i hashtag seek death and like like we talk on my podcast a lot, Keith and I, about about that, about being in those moments where you, you're you there to give your all. You're there to tempt death. You're there to push up against it. And, and when you do, there's a great fucking release that opens. Like your chest opens in a different way and cracks the light of God and spirit through the whole universe that vibrates. And you're involved in the moment like that is immortality immortalizing really i think and i don't think that if you go and you half step and don't commit to those it's like watching you on stage last night if you would have been like on a fucking tear going these fucking chinese people like and and go and gone these fucking chinese people like and let it drop that's you just lost everybody you just lost you need but and that and that's that thing that being fully committed man that i didn't have that peace in life for a long time but man is that fucking a huge investment you make in yourself (sighs) And, you know, for years, Joe Diaz would have gone in there last night, looked around the room, saw one person with white hair and go, I can't do that, Is that, that right? Oh, yeah. Little things would throw you off your fucking plan. Like when I hear about fight plans in the MMA, 
Yeah. Right. Tate, we went over this 80 right. fucking times. Right. Stay away from his fucking left. You went into his fucking left. You know, the same thing happens on stage sometimes. You you fall into ruts where you don't, like, and I would get discouraged by psychological things. There's six old women in the front seat. There goes my pussy. And like bit. some OCD shit. Yeah, like, I can't do that material. I can't do that material. Now, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, if you come into a comedy club, you got to go... I'm willing to accept whatever. Whatever, and I'm going to stick to this joke. If that joke has to say something off color and it's a, a, towards a particular race and there's six of those motherfuckers in the front row, you're going to go up there because it's not what you say, it's how you say Sure. It. These are the things you learn. The thing about stand-up, the first three or four times, and I've had this conversation a thousand times with people, different people wanting to get on stages, I want you just to do it and get it over with. And it sounds so huge, but it's so minute. Do you think you even write anything out or prepare anything or just go walk on stage and burn onto the lights? I'd rather you go up there and burn on the lights. I'd rather you go up there and tell your name like you did in school. Yeah. What, what, what'd you bring us today, uh, Tate? Today I brought you a truck. It's on Hot Wheels. My uncle worked hard to get it for me. I used to have a purple one, but my dog squat ate it. <laughs> now I have this one. Thank you. Thank you. And you... You got it over with. Now you know what feelings you're going to expect. Now you know what type of emotions you're yeah. going to go through. Now you're going to go, no, you know what? Joey told me not to look at their faces. Don't look at their fucking faces. I've been doing it 25 years. You see me looking at people's fucking faces I heard the first it, 10 minutes? Was it Mitch Hedberg that turned around and faced the curtain? Was yeah. that who it was? Yeah. Man, I, th like that's fucking phenomenal just because he wasn't feeling, and he was experienced. Yeah. He just wasn't feeling it that day. He's like, I can't do this. I'm just going to tell my jokes to the, to the blank wall. That's crazy, but it's a craziness, man. It's an interesting thing to be around too, because it's all these such unique, beautiful representations of humanity, all parts in between, and it's amazing what what comes down to the story. You know, when you see all the that, that is like a un little universe. I gotta tell you something. You know, Joe Rogan goes on some some warm ta some fucked up tangents and. One thing he's always said, he says, I always felt there was a certain light that shone on that to attract all those people to that place. Huh. It's something weird about that place that has so many different people. All the people who walked in that stage, you know, from Pryor to Tom Papa to Kennison, Kennison to just, but it's not that. Like, it's just hanging out there. Yeah, it's man. It's like going to. Totally. It's like being a musician and going to the rock, not the Roxy, the one down the corner from the store. The whiskey, or the wh not the whiskey, the one. There's a the key. Lemmy whiskey. used to hang out. Uh, oh, well, Lemmy used to hang out, and people go in there. And you go in there. There's heavy metal guys yep. in there. You know, if you're gonna play music, that's where your ultimate place right. is to go. Is to go there and see what it's it smells also like, like a rainbow. The rainbow. It's like a university. Like, cause you go in there and you get you see Duncan answering the phones, and then you see him graduate onto, you know, doing what he's doing now or whatever. And you, like you, I've seen that with a bunch of different Doc, fucking Doc that was parking like, and he's blowing up now. He's doing great, and he, that's all he's doing, telling jokes. Cause he quit. Yeah. Cause he quit. Yep. He took away the safety net. Yep. Stand up is a very weird animal, but it's no different than any other art you're ever gonna do. It's just doing it getting it over with, analyzing it, which you'll do perfectly after the first time, and then mm. you'll be more prepared the second time, then you'll be more prepared the, the third time. And the good thing about you is stand-up is going to be for you how jujitsu is for me. You know, right now, you're not really planning on going on the road. You have a lot of shit happening. It's not like you're right. going on tour for yep. two months and right an hour. So right now, you're going to focus on two 10-minute sets as, 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 you know, and again, Time, nobody knows time till you're on stage. Right. Ooh, yeah. Three minutes is right. a fucking eternity. That's what I say to dudes about work, about training. Like, we do we do training sessions. I'm like, listen, if you don't understand how long five seconds can be of suffering, like there's five seconds left on the clock and you got to keep moving and the coach is yelling at you and there's a dummy underneath you, your elbow and a knee or whatever, like, then you haven't worked hard. Like, when you know that, like, what seems like a short amount of time is fucking eternity in there and you're burning through it and it hurts every moment, like, all the seconds are broken into hundred parts, fuck, that's different, man. What about when you got a 10-minute set that you got to do? Because and you go you get, blank you get, and you're get, under the light? You're getting oh. money for rent. Oh, that was too much. And at the two-minute mark, you're dying. You're dying. You can't get them back. Your experience 
can never get him back at this point because that's all experience is, is losing him and getting him back. Losing him and getting him back. You know what? I've seen people go up there and say horrible things and then switch it up. And, you know, this shows I do, but I'm a magician because I go to a city like last weekend. I went to uh, Minnesota. Minnesota, House of County, great club. But you know what, man? Right now, at this point, I just shot a special. And the last two months has been deadly on the writing. Not good. I'm trying to write a book. So the writing I'm doing for comedy is right. like it's just not getting together. But I got a couple of bright spots. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a couple little things that once I put four, it's like a constellation. I'm building a constellation. Now I need to get eight stars. Right now I got one. If I could get two more, that's 20 minutes. Now the last 20 will come like nothing. But the first 20, to tighten them up and to go from my daughter to the immigration bill right. to this to that, that's the groove that I'm working on right now. I love I, that immigration piece. I know doing. it's a little pussy hair away, but I'm going through a slump. So what do you do when there's a slump? You stop playing, Tate? No, you just Because you got going. submitted 10 days in a row. Yeah. You don't got anything going to come back now? Yeah. No. This is when you come back. Because by the 18th day, that's when it's all going to come to you. So the last well, and I think that's what commitment is. That's what commitment because is. because you don't give a fuck. Like at the thing, like when you when I feel like I plateaued, and I'm like, well, I just I just keep coming because there's nothing else. This is the thing that I do. Like, and when that becomes the thing that you do, like it doesn't matter how how you know. I, I was tripping out about baseball players the other day. A friend of mine, he's like, you know, if you want to be in the Hall of Fame. You need to hit 30% of the balls. That's failure everywhere in life. If you make a 30% on a test, you fucking, you're, you wrote your name. You're Which retarded. Being the Baseball Hall of Fame. But like if you hit 3 out of 10 balls or 4 out of 10 balls. No one hits 4 out of 10. No one has ever hit 4. Crazy. Like Ted Williams was the last guy to hit 400. So imagine that, bro. You get, no, that's amazingly. You you get up on the plate. I think plate so, right? Yeah. And, and imagine you need one joke to go momentum into the next joke. Imagine if you're going to suck dicks every fucking time or seven or eight out of ten times, but you get up with the same kind of power and panache that can hit a home run every time. That's a mental discipline. I mean, I'm sure there's some of those baseball players that just throw it away, but the guys that are good, that pay attention, that try on every shot, <coughs> to me, that's phenomenal, man. It hasn't been done since uh, Ted Williams did it. Uh, I don't even know what year it was. Let's see crazy yeah that's and so that's a trip to me like that to 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 mark my reinforcement by going like when you're saying about the stars and you're like the and then the last 20 will come easy to not dread it because i think there's something about the way i feel about the thing that i do going into it it's like i can't dread it i've got like or i can and it gets done but it's way more arduous than it needs to be if i'm just excited and I, you know now let me break it down to jujitsu terms what right. if what if your father was a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. And every day from the age of five to the age of 12, he fucked around with you with a Kimura. You could bang a Kimura with two fingers. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is grab the guy's wrist and exactly your arm knows how to do it. Yep. But guess what? You gotta pass my guard to get my Kimura. Right. You have no experience in passing my guard. That's what I gotta do now. Right now I have the bits in the beginning. Now I have to figure out the pass and how they all mix together so you're yeah. going to teach me the the one step behind to break the pass and then i'm going to try to get the two underhooks and put pressure on them and grab this thing and pull myself in you're going to teach me all the pads right now i got the the things i just don't have the pads right that's going to take another month or so it's cool. And, uh, it's cool that you've done it enough that you know how right. much time it takes. That's but dope. for a month, let me tell you something, January and December in my mind were brutal. Is that right? I didn't want to get on stage. Now, were you going up just as regularly as always? Yeah, yeah, always. If I'm out of town, if I go out of town, I do five sets out of town and one on Tuesday. And there's then, a comedy joint right up the road here, right? Yeah, Flappers. No, there's and another the ha -ha, one. right down the corner. And there's another one with a big marquee outside. Yeah, Flappers. Uh, the ha -ha. Is that what it is? Yeah, there's two. Okay. The one is closed down. Okay. You drove past two of them. Maybe. Yeah, but yeah, one yeah. of them is closed down on Lancashire. Like, Shaky, Shaky Town. Shaky Town. 
the ha ha yeah shaky is on the other side looking at, yeah yeah so if we get out of here early we can go over there and we'll put you up tonight <laughs> yeah, 10 30 and shit what time is it? we'll get you out of here <laughs> because that's the only way to do it Ted. bust your nut i can't have no no i'm not busting you nut. no but I to go out there and just break your I'd, rather, I'd rather drop it on you at seven yeah, and I drop it on you at eight in the morning. I, I don't you. want you in that yeah, hell yeah, all yeah, day. Yeah. How am I gonna get out of this? No, that'd I be can't horrible. call Joey. Oh, I know Joey fifteen years. How am I gonna get I out of this? I might get a flat tire on the way yeah, there. Yeah. I might even stage an accident. I mean, that's how bad it fucks yeah. your head. But that's why I would drop it on you like seven. Like, what are you doing tonight, Dave? Yeah. No, pick me up. Let's go to dinner. On the way after dinner, take let's stop at the sportsman's lounge. There's an open mic, and I just throw, you know, it's like when your father oh, takes you swimming when you're six. There. Don't you know how to swim? Let me hold on. Boom, they throw you in, yeah. you flap around, it takes you. That's it. Now you leave there going, Joey, I can't believe I got on stage. <laughs> you're a fucking scumbag. You'll probably even punch me and be mad. But I, I still shake everyone. He did it. He did it. He did it. Lee did it. Really? Yeah, I did it like three or four times, I think. Yeah. And for my special, they brought they brought him up. They made him go That's up. Beautiful. Yeah, I didn't I didn't plan that on the I didn't think you were gonna problem the C D. But you can't think about it. Right. You know, I was telling Lee when I was a sports salesman that I would always kick on Saturdays in the sports selling business. I was always number one on the board. What do you think? Because I did an eight ball on Friday night. Mm. I went to work oh, unconscious. Yeah. So I went back to basics. You know what I'm saying? That's the best coaches. Like, you look at how Greg Jackson coaches guys. You see a lot of guys, they're like, I want to see that four punch combination or whatever. And they, they it's too much. Greg's just there. Okay, I need you to breathe. I need you to breathe. Okay, let's try to count 12 jabs out in the next round. And that and it'll be just that. It'll be just simple nothing. But it, it's like, because the truth is, if I'm trying to work this four-punch cut, whatever the thing is, I'm too late anyway. I got to rely just on my fucking charisma of all of the years of training that I've built into my movement that I'm just going to move in a scrap the way it is because it's a scrap. It's not technique driven in so much as it is the momentum driven of what you've written into your body into your musculature on how to move right and that's i think the magic place to get for fighters is like who are you at your best day in the gym has that guy ever seen the lights of competition and most guys would say no you know and i and i think i think it's the same thing with like with comedy with i mean with so many art forms it's like we need that pressure to be able to polish that fucking diamond man absolutely Absolutely. Art is, never art, done. art is art is art is art. I'm going to tell you something. You don't think I'm crazy? Since I started jujitsu, my stand up has gotten better. Oh, 100%. I know for that. a fact. Yeah. I know for a fact. I, I feel the difference. At all. I feel the breathing. I feel how everything has affected how I've thought and combined them together. Me writing is me being on my back. Nobody likes to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to be That's on their so back. Funny. Nobody wants to write. You know, uh, just so many different things like you know we were talking about one day where you are a very intelligent guy you might come to me and then go joey did you watch my son last night i go yeah that fucking joke he's bombing i go that joke's a funny joke the problem is you're not experienced enough to say it. something about the way you're saying that joke just ain't right selling it's there it's a joke Put that joke away and try it again in three years when you have confidence from a different angle. You know, and things like that always happen. Do you ever ask for help when, like, when you, like, or, or maybe not now anymore, but, like, when you were young and, like, starting out in it, did you ever go to, like, fucking a, another comic and go, hey, look at this. What do you think of this? How do we form this better? And get help with that? Or would that be, like, uh, I don't want to... I don't want to have anybody else's fingerprints on my thing. No, I think that I don't. I won't. I don't ever want to call. Let's say Tate becomes a great joke writer. I don't ever want to call Tate and go, Tate, write me thirty minutes. I'll pay you three thousand dollars. I would never do that. I'm the type of guy I don't want you writing for me at all. But what if I wrote my? I'm writing my own, and I'm going. How do I make this better, Joey? Do you, have, do you have an opinion okay, on that, so or do you no, go? No, no, I don't no. want to put my fingerprints on your shit, Tate. Okay, so no, 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 no. We're going to discuss this right now. So let's pretend me and you meet three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah. And you're like my trainer for jokes. Yeah, so me and you are going to write together. Okay. Okay. Listen, man, two heads are better than one. Three heads are better. Four heads are better. 
all those years when Chris Rock had three of those specials that were tremendous specials mm -hmm. okay what people don't know is let's say HBO would give him a $250,000 advance he would take 50 and give it to Nick DiPaolo a tremendous joke writer he would take another 50 and give it to Richard Jenny as good as the business gets and he would take another 50 and give that to Louis C.K. <gasps> Okay, because he's got no ego. He knows, okay? <laughs> he knows, okay? So did, did, did these guys write a material for him? Not at all. If you'd watch him on Monday nights, if you were at the store, he'd meet up with Nick at the Improv about 8.50, do a 10-minute set. Then on the drive to the Laugh Factory, him and Nick would talk about more shit, and he'd do another spot. And then they'd close it out at the store. And if they were lucky enough, they'd go back to the fucking Laugh Factory and write that bit again. And he would do the same on Tuesday night with whatever his right, name right, is. Right. And then on Wednesday night, he would team up with Louis C.K. So by the end of that special, yeah, it's a 60-minute special. But I guarantee each of those wrote 15 minutes. That's why those specials are so good. Bigger and blacker. The one before that where, what did he say, you know... There's, there's something about remember. being black. Being, about being rich and yeah. wealthy. You know, no, no, no. There's a big difference between being black and there's a big difference between being a nigga. All those brilliant mm -hmm. specials where when he was running with Rich Jenny, and that's what a smart comic does. These guys started together. They know each other like freaking me and you and Lee were white belts 15 years ago. I know Lee likes the North South. I right. know you like a motherfucking come over. So now we don't train no more. Right. But I'm training with Cabrini now. Lee's gone on to train with John Jock. Guess what? Yeah. When you're gonna fight next time, and that guy's a jujitsu specialist, yeah. me and Lee are gonna come down. You're just gonna put us up and feed us. Right. And we're gonna work you. You follow? It's the yeah. same fucking thing. You're gonna come. We're gonna go to you. Remember that? Come so on. So these guys that are dope writers don't really write. You know, knock knock. Who's there? They don't write the joke. They're just helping him see the thing from a different angle and bring out more angle. funny in yeah. it. Yeah. And if you would watch Chris Rock specials, that sarcasm, he has great sarcasm. But take combine it with Nick DiPaolo's, your fucking special is brilliant. So if I if each of these and then guys these guys never feel sorrow sorry because they're like Dude, I gave him my best joke. No. Because it's not me, really theirs. It's like a thing that's joke. grown. Yeah, no. I got it. Yeah. Did you, uh, uh, I, I never knew that. I yeah. always had it backwards. I always figured like when these guys, they get joke writers, that I didn't know that that's, that's a cool style. There's like a that. lot. Of, I like this style better. Yes. Yeah, well, nice. If HBO comes to me tomorrow and goes, we're going to give you half a million dollars in advance pay. You know, we'll give you a quarter of a million up front and a half. I'm going to get three of the best fifth guys I know inside the thing. Yeah. I, I, not necessarily I'm going to get Joe Rogan or Chris Rock. Sure. I might get a feature act that nobody's seen before. You see that Fahim kid? Fahim. <laughs> Did he fuck it up last night? He's so good. Dog, his special's coming out on CISO. I'm really? going to have him on. I'm going to try to get him on next week. He's fucking Dude, good. Dude, I, I was like, I'm it's more. like inspiring. To what? Like he's, no, he's a bad so motherfucker. Good. He's well, he, dangerous. He, he's so. like he was like a former engineer. Like he's really smart. He, it, it comes across, man. It comes across. And that dude, I like him. Like I saw him go in and out of characters. And the problem with fucking dudes that are like comic character guys is that they live that character. Then they become, if it's a douchey guy, they're douchey guys. If it's like a Sparta, like, hey, whiz bang sports fan, then, then they're that guy. And But I saw, you see a guy like that go in and out of characters and he's still so solid on his feet of who he, uh, he's fucking phenomenal, No, he's phenomenal. He was, his, I'm excited yeah. to see his special. This special that I just shot for CISO, yeah. I had a cat, Willie Barcetta, help me. All right, Willie Barson has done 19 Tonight Shows, so he knows the short set. I didn't want the special to be filthy. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be more me. So I would write the material, perform, and send him the performances. And he would write three or four different things. And that was it. He'd tell me, put this here. Don't use that word because we're here to win a fucking fight, not to lose the. Right, you know what I'm saying? Right. So there was a lot of things that we went back and forth. No arguments, no nothing. I trusted him 150. percent He didn't write my special at all. He helped me. Yeah. I would Lee would tape the sets with me. I would tape them on my iPhone, and the next morning I'd email them to Willie, and Willie would send me notes. So by the time I got back from Austin on Sunday, Willie would have all his sets. And Tuesday, when we'd meet, 
he'd have two pages of notes. That's dope. And I would go home the rest of the week and practice that shit at flappers or at the ha ha, and just. And that's stay the interesting out of the thing too. Eye. There's no help. There's no doing it. There's no practicing that shit at home. No. You're, oh, you have to put you your ass out. on the line, and you might go and look silly. You got to risk everything. You got to go and risk it. Me shooting a special, I looked at it as me training for a fight against Anderson Silva. <laughs> That was it. It's the same yeah. thing. You got to do the same shit every day. You got to sleep, eat. I got to think about this. I got to get up and my back hurt. Right. I've never sat that much in my life. Now I do exercises while I'm sitting down, if I'm sitting that long. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to write in like two-hour chunks, smoke dope, run yeah. errands, come back, go to a coffee shop now, change locations, two hours, go home. And that night after everybody went to bed, I go to Starbucks till midnight over here excuse me on magnolia so i always had different things to 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 you know i don't Inspiring. like right yeah yeah you know i have a conversation with lee i love jujitsu but there's only one thing i don't like about jujitsu a day like today who the fuck wants to roll inside on a day like today you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, a day like today, I would usually blow off jujitsu, get kettlebells, go to NoHo Park, swing five sets, couple cleans, couple squats, and just walk around the track. Yeah. Stretch out, get some sun. That sweat is a natural, yeah, whatever. Great, I love right now outside in the sun. Like, I love it. I love it. There's something about, you know, if you read uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's book on writing, it's called On Writing. Very interesting book. He talks about a way that he used to have his room and how he breaks it down for motherfucker. Really? Oh, Stephen King on on writing breaks it Stephen down. Stephen King, not Steven Spielberg. No, Stephen King. I'm Stephen sorry. King, yeah. So order it right now on Amazon. Right. You're going to love it. He has great shit because he's like us. He's a real yeah. fucking dude. That dude did coke and heroin. Really? Yeah, I, bro, I just heard this shit. Like he was on Sons of Anarchy. You know, that's a trip because I was. Yeah, he was, was on Sons of Anarchy. As a kid, I was. I, I always figured if you're successful, you're on the straight. That's what they sell you. That's if you, you're on the straight and narrow. If you're success and like he's a successful writer, so I, you know, in the meantime, how the fuck do you think you write a heroes book about kill a dog themselves and shit? You know, that, that yeah, right, kills people. Yeah, you know, I think he had Carrie the yeah, dog, yeah. the fucking hey. Carrie was a piece of paper. It was a couple pages that he had wrote. About, he was a janitor at the time in New Hampshire or wherever the fuck he was living. And he was working as a janitor at a high school or a grammar school. I don't know. You'll correct me after you read this. And he saw the period box in the girls' bathroom. Oh. <laughs> so he wrote a couple lines about that. And then he wrote a couple lines about people who have superhuman natural brain abilities. Right. People that could move stuff. So he took whatever he had, he wrote like 30 pages on it, he threw it in the garbage. And that night when he got home from work, his wife took it out of the garbage and said, I read this, this is really good, that's Carrie. Crazy. How fucking crazy. Isn't that that's was, the wild thing too, is like how we never good enough for our own shit, yeah, for yeah, our own he, credit. He's gonna break down so much shit for you. And it's just an interesting book. It's cool. Whether man. you wanna be a writer or not. Right. I mean, this is just a book from this guy's perspective. Anything. And I think he talks about his addictions and like he was snorting blow to write. Yeah. You know, I, yet last night I was watching something before I went to the store about Ernest Hemingway. He sat at the same fucking yep. place every day and wrote and got a hammer. Hammer. He hung out there for 10 fucking years. You know, uh, the guy that f Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Yeah. Hunter he was no Thompson, fucking guy. Bukowski. Bukowski with this, I, you know, they were all. What's had his name them, into the dope? Uh, the Spanish guy. The, uh, the one that. Uh, the guy that created Miami anyway, but, Vice. But everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They each got to have something. Yeah. This is what takes that imagination. I remember one time Tate and I were at the... Uh, Tate's going to go, Joey Diaz, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Tate and I were in Austin, Texas at the... Uh, what's the name of the restaurant? We go to the across from the hotel. Papa Do's. Papa Do's. And me and Eddie and all those guys, but me and Tate were getting into a conversation about how Alice in Chains wrote their music <laughs> on heroin. Look at him. He's going, oh, my God. And Adam Tate looking at me going, that's interesting. Like, Tate was heavy into the, you know, you were very sober then. You were yeah. very proud. And you were like, that's interesting. I can't imagine, Joey. And you went like, uh-uh. 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 What's that song they do? Wood, yeah, isn't it yep, wood? Yep. Or oh, man in the box, uh, or or, or uh, 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 here comes the 
rooster. Yeah, you know, but the one we were talking about yeah. was, uh, yeah, you know, the box. if you listen to that whole fucking album, it's laced with heroin. Oh, down so in a good. hole. If you've ever been in a hole, yeah, you know exactly. You know who they wrote like under a different beat is fucking Lou Reed. Lou Reed used to write fucking poetry, man, street poetry about fucking dope and hookers and fucking trannies, everything, man. He was the fucking man. That's but these that's on, on 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 down in the hole. I have it on my iPod, and it's like the second song I listen to. When I have two thousand milligrams of THC in me, and, uh, I just, and I put my seatbelt on, that's the second tone. I have like an order on the plane, and I listen to down the hole like two or three times. In the first section of lyrics, you know, holding red flowers in the tomb and all that shit down in the hole, and I don't know if I could be straight or what. I could feel his pain. Yeah, I could feel what the fuck they were writing. I mean, when he sang that, he had no teeth on MTV. Yeah, he had no fucking teeth. The, the heroin. How bad does it get when your teeth are fucking gone oh, on MTV? How good is it? How good is it? Oh yeah, that's the other side. You know what I mean, it's so good. Don't get him started. Teddy's gonna start bringing heroin in again. He's gonna. Oh, oh man, it well, is not again, but so good. It's like that, and people don't they don't get it. It's like that's how good it is. Like I can be pulling scabs. Off. I watched uh, last time I saw a dude shoot up. I was in Vancouver, and I was uh, looking out the window of this alley, and this dude's trying to hit his neck. And the only time anybody tries to hit their neck is because all their other veins are gone. gone Nothing's gone, available, gone. right? And and you know, and so he he and he can't get. And I'm like, it, and I'm watching for fucking ten minutes, fifteen. Wait. And I'm uncomfortable as fuck. I'm like, I hope, come on, get it this time, get it. Like, I'm as, I, I'm like him. I'm like, I've become him. And, and fucking, he finally hits it and that relief comes. And, and it is, it's a, it's like a wind tunnel of dirt and scabies just blowing through this fucking alley. There's 30 junkies all in there strewn about the place. And fucking, he's there and he fucking gets it. And it's just like, whew, and you just know he's home. And fuck, man. You ever shoot anything? Yeah. yeah. What'd you shoot, coke? Yeah, coke and heroin and morphine. What'd you think of the coke shooting? The coke? I don't like it so much. I, I did it a few times with a buddy of mine because that like that he he liked it because as soon as it hit his veins, he'd throw up. And he's like, then I could know how good the coke was if I was going to buy weight. And like, it was just like, a, a, it was like he would get a taste like that. And that was his, that was his thing, you know? Um, I can't imagine shooting up on a daily basis, on a multiple times a day basis. It's one of the things like when I when I first got clean and I go, uh, you know, a couple months in, I didn't have nothing out. Like, there's nothing to look forward to. Not for years uh. for me. There's nothing for years. But I, one of the things was that I didn't have to get high any anymore. And that and like and there's a different thing. Like when you say I can't imagine doing it on a daily basis. Like like uh, the thing is is like you can't imagine not because like your hope. That's all. That's all the life is. That's the word. That's the only place you get freedom. I got one friend. He shoots uh, speed. And, now, yeah, and he um, and uh, he was clean for a while. Then he whatever, whatever. But he hits it, man. Sometimes he says he'll he'll fucking put powder in the barrel and he'll draw blood to mix the blood. Yeah, the speed yeah, get, yeah. So there's no dilution, right? And he hammers it. And he says, and when I, I said, I said, are you getting any relief anymore at all? Are you getting? Is there any freedom in there? Because that's what we're hunting, man. And uh, and he goes, he says, you know, I blast it. And fucking my my knees will fucking shake and give out, and right before I drop to the ground, I feel fucking free. I'm set free, and and that's all he's getting is that millisecond right there anymore, right? But he's still, you know, you can't get away from it. It's fucking crazy, dude, man. It's like it's a wild thing, you know. That's why I think we're built to have fun. We're built to feel good, man. I got to push all the ways to feel good and to have fun that I can. Because, like, there, there's, I mean, however you do it, you do it, like, whatever it is. But, like, some are more sustainable than others, you know? Hey, I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to, I can't sit here and, from the age of 16 to when I got locked up at 27. If there was no coke, I wouldn't leave the house. Oh. Like, if you called me and said, Joey, I got three chicks here, we're going to rock and roll. Did you get anything? Nah, I couldn't get anything. What about your friend? Nah, I'm not going to go down there. 
Yeah. To stand in a bar and drink three beers? Fuck, no. That's not going to happen. There's, I mean, how sad is that taste? It's pathetic. It's but, fucking pathetic. But, but, like, dudes would ask me, they go, well, what do you do, Coke? What would you do? Like, are you, 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 or, or, like, what, what are you going to do? Like, let's, let's go, go to, go to the club. I'm not a club guy. I'm fucking not that, like, I, it's like, that's not something where I'm like, oh, it really makes me miss drinking or something, like, to see a bunch of dickheads at a club, like, is not my thing. But, like, that, I'm like, I'm doing Coke. What do you mean? Like, they're like, well, what are you going to do tonight? I'm like, it's called doing cocaine. I'm going to look out the window some. I'm going to have the fucking TV on with the volume turned way down. And I'm going to do cocaine until there's no cocaine left. And I'm going to stay up for as long as that takes. Like, And, and I'm going to fucking, it's going to be like that. And, like, and, and then I remember I got locked up once on a Friday. And so I'm there until Monday, probably, to oh. see the judge, right? And a dude hits me up. He comes in. He goes, hey. He says, hey, you want to do some blow? I go, I go how much blow you got? He goes, I got a quarter gram. I go, no. And I didn't have a problem saying no because I could not imagine the feeling of what that craving is like when I get that in me that I'm going to fucking sit there for 72 hours wanting more. Fuck oh. you. I'll chew through your neck, you cocksucker. When I got sentenced, that morning I got sentenced, you know, I say my goodbyes. I got a suit on. I walk into the fucking cell. There's a camera. I'm by myself. There's a fucking toilet, another thing. I had been snorting for three days straight. And three, because they called on Friday and said, community corrections didn't take him. You got to go convince this fucking judge or he's going to jail. Mm. They told me this Friday at five. So that changed all the whole, I thought I was going to court and I was going to walk out of there. That's how fucking delusional I was. That's what planet I fucking was at. Yeah. Kidnapping a machine gun. Yeah, sure. You're going to beat it. Fine, right. Right. But the cocaine was like, I'm going to go in there Monday. I'll talk to the judge. I swear to God, Dave. Like, I have no reason to lie to you, Dave. Like, I was like, I was going there Monday, and I'll put some fucking, I'll tell the judge here. I'll give him a story. I couldn't even talk. And that judge said, do you have anything to say? Ooh. I couldn't even talk. You know me, though. Yeah. I could talk for hours. I was like, <laughs> I, I couldn't talk from being nervous. And he sentenced me. I went in the back, and after all that, Dave. I go in the back, and it was one of those suits where you put the coke in, and you hide it, and you forget. And for some reason, I'm sitting in the prison cell, I'm in there 20 minutes. Now I'm going through my clothes, like just, wow, look at this shirt. I take the jacket off, and for some reason, I took the napkin out of Holy the handkerchief. Holy fuck. And there it is, front and center, a rock of coke <laughs> that I had been saving since God knows when. And I just crunched it up in front of the camera with my fingers in the suit pocket. I went in my wall, I took a dollar bill out, I put the whole dollar bill in that fucking thing, and I went back to the faucet and turned it on, snorted the whole fucking gram in there one shot, because by that time, that's what I was doing right. when I was 27. I could do a whole fucking bag at one shot. Yeah. I flushed it down the toilet with the dollar bill. I waited for them to come, but they didn't see me. Even the, the dollar bill clean first. And brother, let me tell you something. I think 10 minutes in, the coke was tremendous. But between the uh, the relief of knowing I was going to jail and everything else, right. I fucking passed out. Crazy. Like passed out, like passed out, like woke up like at 7 o'clock. When I did that coke, it was 1 in the afternoon, and it was a gram, which right. for an hour you're sitting there fucking jawing. Right. It didn't even hit me that way. Like because the release, the relief of knowing that I was in a, it was for a year. I was living in this Yeah, you're living with the other hammers. You know, every, everybody I'm talking to is like, good luck. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll leave it in God's hands. As much as you think you're going to beat something, you know. I, I, I was convinced because of my cocaine addiction that I was going to talk him into a work release job and I was going to snort coke and work release. Machine gun and kidnapping. Machine gun and kidnapping. This is how retarded it's, drugs it's so, do to you. You know, cocaine is so good. At fucking people up, that your whole life can be spiraling down the shitter with turds right behind it, and you think you're killing it. Killing it. I thought I was. I thought I was going to talk. Fucking a crazy. No, no, no. I thought I was going to go in there and smooth the judge over. Yeah. Like this is the beauty of this. At thirty, at no, I started comedy. I went to prison in '87, which made me 24 years old. At 24 years old, I thought I was going to actually go in there and smooth the judge over. Like, judge, let me talk to you. But no, I got sentenced August 15th of '88. So that means I was 25 years old and I went to prison. Well, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go talk to him. That's how retarded I was at 20 fucking five. 
Let me go talk to this guy. Do you remember what your lawyer was saying? My lawyer was telling me to keep my fucking mouth shut. You know, my lawyer was phenomenal. I mean, he did an amazing fucking job. I recently called him and found really? him. Really? Found him, and I said, listen, I didn't want your work to be in vain. I go, I finally got my life together. I'm a comedian. I'm married. I have a child. I'm 50. And he was like, you, you, you can't be telling me this shit. He goes, my son. No. So that was the conversation we had the first day. Then the second day, he called me. And he goes, I went home and told my son, my son knows everything about you. Yeah. You were in the longest yard. All this shit. He goes, Jesus Christ. He goes, he's studying to be in film. So I said, when he becomes a big director, tell him to call his Uncle Joey. You know Fuck what I'm saying? Yeah, Don't baby. call me now. Call me. But yeah. But what took you to Seattle then? Abroad. Yeah. Abroad and air. Stop did they have that, did, stop with that goddamn can. Did they have the a did thing. they have a better uh did they have a better comedy scene there or anything like that? Absolutely. Big city. It's like a real it's like LA. See, like that city's a huge fucking West Coast city. Denver at the time was McKelvey's Wits End. Now, is the place that I've been to in Denver, is that, was that open back then? Denver Comedy Works. The place that it, it got all brick and shit. It's fucking real nice. Yes. Big old, yeah, that's yeah. been there since 81. I love that building, man. I just got a sweatshirt from them. Like their anniversary. I just found it. They gave it to me when I was there in August, but I just found it. I must have put it in a closet. And it was like their 50th anniversary. Rad. You know, Denver only had the Comedy Works and those other two clubs. But before those two clubs opened... They would have to go to a Boulder, and Boulder it was a jazz club called the Blue Note. And that's where, like, Roseanne did comedy. I mean, everybody was doing that's Tom sure. Arnold. Yeah. Is that because the college was more of a, like, they had better venues for, like... No, no, no. That's all they had available for comedy Crazy. was a jazz club. You know, if you look into the history of comedy over the years, it was done with burlesque. And then it was done very avant-garde, like in the... Uh, 60s and then like in the 70s is when i think the first comedy club popped up like i've heard different stories pittsburgh the funny bone in pittsburgh which is not there no more i would guess that it's like uh kind of like the the first guy is the guy that's in between bringing up acts and he's telling little jokes he's like how am i going to fill the space in between the baton twirler and the fucking lion tamer. He's like, I'll tell some... And, and like, it started as like that kind of job, I bet. And then somebody goes, I wonder if somebody would just like to see that all the time. And then there's a headline comic made. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, because they're guys that have stage presence, that have charisma, that can sway a crowd, pump a crowd up, ultimate hype man, keep them laughing, you know? I wonder where they were born from, those first comics. They're doing a show right now on CNN called The History of Comedy. I watched 15 minutes of what I, had, I was busy that night. I don't know what night it comes on. But I think, like, Fordville, but I know they have, like, fucking cavemen drawings. <laughs> or some guy up there hitting a the drum with his dick or something. There's got to be, you know. There had to be humor. I mean, they talked about with Jokers and... Well, wow. what are those people? Court jesters and yeah, all that stuff. Jesters. So somewhere along yeah. the line, I guarantee we're going to see bricks of fucking stand-up clubs in Africa. Some guy, and if you were really bad, they just threw a spear at you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They yeah. just chucked the fucking spear right through your fucking heart. You're you going to be entertainment in one kind or another. Let me give some shout-outs here real quick. Yeah. To my motherfuckers in the game. Smarry Army. Swarmy Army. Whatever the fuck it is. Our gun Machado, Gabor, James Harrison, XZ Podcast, the whole Monty Curtis Harmon, Real Joe Williams, and my man Matthew Stone. I love you, cocksuckers. Anyway, where were we? Sorry. Man. I love that. You gotta, well, let, you gotta let them know. You know, you see him on Twitter or Facebook. Man, I love interacting, dude. I, I like I try to answer all the goddamn Snapchats and I'll tell you, though, I fucked up. I don't know if I fucked up or not. Lee can be the judge. But I, I was down in Mexico. You know Scotty that runs on the mat? Yes, yes. And he's so, friends with John Salami and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so he's got a hospital down there, like a cancer remediation and drug therapy kind of. Does he? Yeah, they do curse and juicing. And I did hyperbaric chambers. I did. They do coffee enemas all day long to kind of to release uh, this antioxidant that lives in your liver, basically. And... and uh, and cleans you out and 
They do, uh, they do everything. They did ozonate. They take my blood out. They put it through an ozone machine, and then they put it through UV light and put it back in. Kills all the viruses in your body. Like they do all types of shit. And uh, so I'm down there and I'm doing enemas. And these guys, you're not on Snapchat. You can't even. Te- I gotta remind you about tech. Yeah, you know Gino at Speedweed. He got. He's like, uh, I got a picture that Joey. It's on Joey's phone, but he's not good at texting. I go, you're fucking right. He's not. And. Uh, he says, "See if you can get." This. So we got to remember, remind us. You're not gonna remember. Look at you. I don't remember. No, no. It's uh, I'm okay. But what happened with the? Uh... Anyway, so I go down there and I, I get all these guys. They can add you on your story, so you're just fucking. It's an onslaught of pictures of dogs and their lunch and their this and their that on Snapchat. And I'm like, hey, how about don't do that? Because I like to interact with people and I don't need to be added to your timeline. Anyway, long and short of it, I fucking got it, and I'm a thing and i got coffee in it and then i take a picture of that send it to like 30 guys that all have fucking savaged me with their boring fucking shit and then a picture of the hose and then a picture of my asshole was the finisher for them and i i fucking send that out to all these guys and they're like holy and then the finisher finisher was what was in the toilet after the animal comes up oh no and just i and i'm like you're welcome how about keep me off your fucking timelines since then, it's been real nice in my neighborhood. No, wait a second. So, I don't do Snapchat because I, know. I get confused as it is. <laughs> I, I'm good with Twitter. I'm good with Periscope. You're good on I'm MySpace. Good yeah, I used to be good on MySpace, but I'm not good on this other shit. Snapchat, you got I'm check. impressed with how much you do on Periscope. Like, you're I a do, savage on there. Well, I do two before the podcast, and I try to do one on Monday and Fridays, especially when I'm in a different city. That's cool. You want to smoke a joint, give them a look. Do you do you, do you live stream this? Yes. You do live stream it. Yeah. Yeah, it's going on right now on YouTube. God damn. And then I'd be eating my snots. All right. Oh, I'm stop. Please, the fucking please snot. don't talk about that again. I'm just teasing. I'm just, oh, he I'm, doesn't. He's I, that's it. Don't talk about it. Right? You know what I'm going to talk about? You want me to tell the story from today? Sure. No, I can't tell you the story about the snot today. Anyway. Too savage. No, it's, it's true. So give yourself a uh, look at the calendar tonight when you go home. Yeah. Look at the rooms and look at the, you know, they got all the, oh, I'll tell you where you're going to go, where Tommy Easter goes. Marty's. Marty's. Nobody's okay. going to see you there. All right. Nobody's going to know who you are. Cool. You go down there, you sign where up, is you it? pay three bucks. It's right in Hollywood. On Sunset. Uh, on Sunset and uh, <sighs> I got to write it in. It's right, across, right down the block from the fucking Israeli restaurant. On Sunset, my favorite. Aroma. Aroma. I like Aroma. Yeah, it's right down the block from How's there. Aroma Israeli? It's it's a it's actually a coffee shop in Israel. Like it's really? Yeah, they, they got one on Studio City too, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's they're, they're not related. Oh, they're not. No, the Aroma in Hollywood. That's where they have the salmon. Yeah. Fucking delicious. They got a they got a couple good fucking dishes in there, Jack. Marty's on Sunset. Yeah. Is yeah. that what, is and, that what it's called? I, did you get the picture I is sent it every you every night? Yeah, seven nights a week. Okay. I think it's like five bucks to get Five bucks, and you go and you get on stage ten times in one night if you want, because they just keep rotating. I did, I got it. They just keep rotating you. So it's fucking tremendous. I'm really proud of you, Tate. This will will change your life. I'm excited, if you do it as a hobby for a while, just to get your feet wet, it's another thing. Listen, knowledge is power, Iacocca. Yeah, baby. Iacocca said that. Knowledge I just is want, power. I, I just, I like, I like to spread it out. I like, I like, it's the next like scary thing. Like, is it because it's like wrestling, right? It's like you're wrestling this new thing, and like, well, get good at that too, you know. And that's what I want to do. I don't want to just do it a few times. I'd like to make it part of my living lifestyle. How do you get into like just speaking about doing things that are scary? You're into a lot of different businesses. How did you get? How do you get into jujitsu and coffee and I don't need like a, a bar and I don't well, jujitsu is different. I got into jujitsu to stop my head, and I just wanted to uh, like I, I just want I, I, there was always a, a thing in my in my body. I think where I was like I want to be able to use this i want to be able to be useful at it or whatever and like when i had the chance to jujitsu fascinated me because i got arm barred by a dude that was 100 pounds lighter than me three times in under a minute same arm and i was baffled i had no idea how that happened like because i thought i was tough right and so then i just dove into it and, and i was i got in there through stick fights through a group um you know you did collie 
Uh, it was like Kali, Eskrima, Krabi Cabron. The dog brothers. Like a, yeah, yeah, no you're holds friends barred with the dog stick brothers, fight. Aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Right, because somebody said you were friends with one of them. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. The one of the fo- well, it's a couple of the founders I'm good friends That's with. That's a great. I mean, then, uh, he was saying that Alberto was telling me that there was he goes ask oh, yeah, he knows one of the guys had a belly. He goes that one of the guys had a belly, and whenever he do jujitsu, he had a move that he would just fucking put it on your yeah, face. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I think I don't know if that's your story or that's a guy in Brazil. He was telling me. He goes, Joey, the guy tapped everybody with his belly. He goes, I was the only guy he never tapped out. You know why? He goes, because I used to make like a straw in my mouth. Dog. <laughs> I fucking busted out. Of He's like, I would just sit there, Joey. <laughs> He'll find an opening. He's man. not tapping me out. <laughs> yeah. He's not tapping me out. He goes, but the guy would. But he was saying something about the dog brothers that you hung yeah, out with. There was yep. a guy there that was heavy. Yeah, Arlen. And he wouldn't move a lot, but he had a move. I forgot what he his had. Move a couple. Was. He had a couple moves that he would do, and if and if you could withstand it, he didn't have air to last for the next few minutes, and so you just you just had to withstand the storm. It was like it was like fighting a really good wrestler. Like real good wrestler ain't gonna finish you, but he's gonna beat your ass all the way up till you get to choke him. But you get to choke him. You know, like, and that it was like that. Like, that's it's like real, you know, real strong guys without the wind is that's trouble for them if you can withstand that. And you got when you're that big, that's a lot of air. Yeah, that's a lot of air. I see these guys that go into the UFC with tons of muscle, and by the second round, they're huffing and puffing. You got to shave away at that muscle a little bit, something, something to get the air in there. Those muscles require a lot of oxygen to fucking work, man. My friend, uh, my friend. He owns a Gracie Baja now in Albuquerque, but um, Don Ortega, and he'd say, just because you're buff don't mean you're tough. Like when all these steroid guys would walk into the gym or something, and they'd all get strangled. It's just what, whatever you're trained at, you know, whatever you're good at. It's not just technique. you got to be in the fire and be underneath the suffering of somebody else on top of you trying to strangle the life out of you, and that's where you grow. And you can't grow like that anywhere else than in those conditions. I don't. No, when people get involved in different things, whether it be stand up or fighting or, or whatever, painting or yeah, just one being of the a cellist, the, the, like the internal suffering that you have, it's this weird. You know, you said it best before the universe. We never think about the universe. When you wake up in the morning, you look out your window, the stars. We never think about the universe, not the fucking universe that they talk about in Armageddon, the universe, the spiritual universe, you know, goal writing. Let's talk about goal writing. Kid came to the show last Friday. He goes, before I listened to your podcast, I never wrote a goal in my life. Wow. He goes, I I started writing goals and pretty soon they started coming up. That's because you put something into the universe. Yeah, you project. You know, when I call you the first year of your stand-up career, I would never call you and say this to you. But there's a lot of people who call you and go, Tate, what are you doing tonight? Nothing. Come on down. Do 15 minutes in front of 400 people. You know, you're not going to get paid. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would pay you, but then most people won't pay. But it's not about the money. It's about you going down there. Right. Because you just put something into the universe. Whether you bomb or not, you don't know what you're doing. Right. You have no idea what you just did. Yep. You did something from the kindness of your soul that two people are going to laugh. That means you made two people out of the 400 laugh. They're going to think your goofy ass is funny after two weeks of doing comedy. There always is. And, you know, people don't want to put things into the universe anymore. And before the universe gives you something back, the universe you and I live in, because right. we believe in karma, we've done time, we've done drugs, and we've seen all the, you know, when you hit somebody in the head to take $30, <laughs> and all of a sudden, two weeks later, you got $32 and you lose it when you jump into the water, and you right. go, and you remember the 30 you stole two weeks later. <sighs> the universe gives you signals. That's it's why a- I was always scared that the other shoe was going to drop. It's because I was always forcing the other shoe to drop. I would there make you a, go. I would make an action that there was for sure going to be a reaction to a couple weeks later, and maybe I'd be dumb enough to not be able to see the scope of the whole reaction, like that there were related issues. They're the same issue. Yeah, man, for sure. The universe is a very, you know, with stand-up comedy, with acting, it's a very Is that weird, sativa or indica? Indica. It's a, this is from Gino. Do you prefer indica or do you prefer sativa? If you have a certain type of sativa, 
that'll sizzle my eyeballs, I'll smoke it. But that Jack Carrera and all that shit, that shit don't do nothing to Uncle Joey. We brought us a TV in here a couple of weeks You don't get high on it. Not at all. What about you? Uh, I can I it, it it's not the same though. I, I prefer the indica. It's uh we're indica motherfuckers. Yeah. I, it's probably just because that's all I've smoked with Joey for years. Right. Because I I actually I do and I did enjoy the one because he got me a seat a sativa once from Perennial, and he told me to smoke it before I did some work, and I actually saw the benefits of it. I was like, oh yeah, I could see that happening, but I I, I still prefer indicas. Interesting. I get the benefit from whether I smoke or eat it. Anything that calms me down. And lets me settle on one thing. Yeah, they say the sativa is like more of a encourager or, a, or whatever, more of an. Well, it gets you high, but it gets you motivated. Not motivated; it gives you energy. That's what people say. Say they like sativas. I get energy from an indica. You, yeah, me too. I get energy from the thought pattern. The thought pattern. The first, you know, I, I I don't sit down after I smoke weed. Like that shit about sitting and watching movies. Right. That was when I was twenty two. That 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 now. I get high to work, not really stand up, but everything that goes with stand up, you know, dealing with this, the podcast, writing jokes. Yep. When I write my book, when I'm writing a couple paragraphs in the book. Are you writing that with somebody? I have an agent, Yeah, but I'm pretty much writing it alone at this point. And I've been really, really on it, and I'm really proud of myself. How do you do it? Do you say, I'm going to write three hours in the morning no matter what, or only when inspired, or how do you keep the ambition to do it going? First off, I start with writing a sentence a week. A friend of mine that used to listen to the podcast said, I just want you to start with a sentence a week, and two or three times I failed. A, certain, a sentence a day. A sentence a day, I'm sorry. And I failed like two or fucking three times a sentence a day. I would do four days. But I would still do it, you know? But four days is like going to jiu-jitsu once a week for two years. Nothing ain't really going to happen. Right. Because by the time you go there next Monday, you forgot about what you learned sure. the week before. You only got four rolls the week before. So after, while I was writing the special this year, I got that thing where, you know, again, if you want something to happen, you got to sit there for two hours and really write and really think. And I don't sit there and waste that energy no more. All right? So... I've said this a thousand times. When you first start writing, you're going to go, okay, uh, uh, immigration. I heard Chinese people got immigrated, okay? Chinese, so what are you going to do? So for three fucking hours, you're going to sit like this at the coffee shop? I'm sitting with the pen between my, think, my teeth, making believe I'm thinking. Right. This is what happens. You just wasted three hours. Fuck that. Write this, but I want you to exercise. I want you to write a story about the first time you went to rehab. That's it. Joey, but what? Because you're working that muscle. Yeah. You're working that muscle. This is a muscle. This is a muscle. Believe it or not, this is a muscle. But the real muscle is sitting your ass in the chair. That's the muscle we all lack. Is actually sitting down for that hour going. Mitch Hedberg did it every day. If you called Mitch Hedberg at 11 o'clock, you wouldn't get an answer. From 9 to 12, he shut everything off. His house was empty. His window was open. He was pointed north. <laughs> and he fucking wrote, you know. Getting divine intervention. Yeah. Sometimes people, uh, you know, they have the certain pattern to write. I read about a lot of authors, and some of them have the certain Yeah, thing. Hemingway had a way. Yeah. Burroughs had a way. All everybody has a certain way, but... The f you have a way. It's sitting down and doing that fucking way and doing it. Right. I think Every everybody's looking day. for magic, right? They're, yeah. they're looking for a light switch to go off. But nobody wants to sit there long enough. There's no fucking light switch. There's you just can't you. Run this fucking office because this is a small office. Good. You're so you're go store. you're gonna go outside. No, you gotta leave the window open if you wanna fart. You gotta let. So me you know farted it. in here and you then, farted in here. That's I a wish, tape fart. I wish I did. Or a fucking leaf fart. I didn't fart. Don't. Somebody like fucking farted. I've farted this in years. Remember, I would fart though and blame you. And no, but and everybody shit. knew it wasn't me because you so had that good. protein shit. I would start laughing. I had cocaine farts. Cocaine you had you had farts. whey protein fart. That fart is a whey protein fart. What's it called? Mixed fart? with that fucking coffee and shit. Not me, baby. Whey protein farts. It, it's disgusting. It was the worst. The worst was there. We, I went into a 7-Eleven with Eddie Bravo, and he would hunt for stuff that had warnings on it. And he'd say, eat this, Tate. And it would be it'd be like certain sweeteners that had some shit in it that was horrible. 
I can't I think mean, of the fucking the worst name of it. thing ever. Was but they were the worst. They were the worst. I was fucking oh. Texas, and we're at the Barnes and motherfucking Nobles on the second floor, and we're all sitting in chairs, and I cut a fart in that motherfucker that the whole place heard it, and we all got up and walked out of Barnes and like Nobles like gentlemen, like gentlemen. <laughs> I, I blasted a fart in there. That was a loud one. See, I was good for loud ones. The stinky ones, you were the fucking most Master. horrible. And he I would open the door, room. the window, come back two hours later, and you could still smell the the, the intestine of the fart. The like the middle of the fart. Like if you take a piece of shit and cut it in half, it smells completely different. Like once you cut that, it. when you're walking down the street, <laughs> sure it does. Sure it does. How many times you go to the bathroom? And you take a poop and your shit breaks in half. And all of a sudden, like, a real skunk comes out. <laughs> like, one piece is so heavy on the... It's like a metal... It's like a steel bat. Like, one that piece That this is, is real so heavy. heavy. It just breaks when it's in your muffler and you still got three inches in your muffler. <laughs> and it releases that Batman fucking smoke Ooh. out of there. Horrible. Horrible. We got to get more fiber in that life. No, I always eat more fiber. That's why I don't fart like that. Do you still do the much. green stuff? Which one? The I don't know, protein drink? No, like, just as just greens. I eat salads. There was some green thing that you were like. Yeah, I was drinking or something like that. Yeah. Terrible, yeah. terrible, terrible, terrible. God, they all taste bad. They all taste fucking bad. I dope up every protein powder I get. Yeah. All of them taste like that. I don't eat any of them. Really? I, I quit don't... all that shit. Like, I, I do like amino acids sometimes, but I don't, sub, like, I eat food, like, and that's, like, I don't really fuck with protein powders. Sometimes I'll do like a recovery one. Uh, a friend of mine makes it's nice, but most of them give you gut problems. Like, most of them are filled with some kind of, crazy isolate that is fucked up and makes your guts all bloated or twi- I, and i just i'm like i don't like it man it doesn't make me feel good and i don't think it has a benefit i think we've been sold a big bill of goods about like how much protein like i think the supplement companies are really like bro supplement companies make oh dude a ton of money you know that's my next business supplements sure why not i got a great endurance one i got fucking some good amino all natural all natural flavors because all of them got cancer in them and so we've got natural sweeteners natural flavors all that kind of stuff in them uh we'll be out in a couple months but yeah man i like i don't know like you asked about like i wouldn't do any of them businesses i wouldn't do any of this stuff i don't look at it and go here's the plan i'm going to take i throw my hat over the fence and then i got to crawl over the fence to get my hat and i think that's how you get stuff done sometimes is because if i knew all the work that went into making like caveman coffee or pirate life podcast or any, like i wouldn't fucking do it i wouldn't take that on i wouldn't take all the headaches and the emotional stuff and the fucking try to get everybody's uh character and and personalities together it's a lot but it's also then the thing that you built that you love and that you take care of like a baby and you're like this is a fucking cool thing that i have thought i've thought the idea into the universe like and made a thing like it's so it's kind of dope too it's in because i have the exact right now i'm going through a period where i'm trying to get as much out as possible so i can focus on only a couple things well you're going to need to get an assistant well, no, I don't need an assistant. Either. Now that you've gone into these six digits, I know where you're at, Lee. I know where you're at. <laughs> I, I, hopefully, hope, hopefully one day. But if, if, if I get an assistant so before I should talk Joey about does, a kill me. We don't need no fucking assistant. That's the problem in this town is everybody needs a fucking assistant. <laughs> uh, at the end of the week, they you know, don't you do can get, You can get yourself an intern. I went over on that uh, that, that Callens deal and, and Brendan, and... um. They got interns, and I'm like, "What's an intern?" They're like, "They do all the work, and we don't pay." Like, it's like, it's like you know what I mean? It's like, I was like, "That's amazing!" Like, they're like, "Yeah, it's fucking great." People are just learning the business, are learning this and that. And they I was do like, all the work, and we wow. don't. Wow. But my thing that would break my heart with that, I like people, I like working with people, and I would hate for that person to go. You know what? This don't serve me anymore. So fuck this. I'm not doing this either. Like I would only want those positions to segue into something where pretty soon you can be driving a BMW. You know what I mean? Like I, I wanna. That's that. That's the whole point of the internship. That's a whole. I mean, it's tough when you're in school because if you're in school, you can't get a job. But you when, need, when you're you a senior, money. when you're a senior, like that's the hope is you'll intern there and then get an, a get a job offer. I don't want anybody in here working for free. Number one. Not even in, I don't want anybody working for free. And number two, I don't want nobody in here. <laughs> That's the beauty about And that me. could be number one. I don't want nobody in here. I don't want nobody in here. What's you know, this guy? That's San Lazaro. 
He's a, a saint of the dogs and shit. Those are the people that were going to kill Michael Vick. That's why I didn't let him in a lot of federal really? prisons. Really? Cubans are real big in San Lazaro, so. That's like, so that's like St. Francis. Also, yeah. like the, the patron saint animals, right? Yeah, so. But these guys go a little deeper. They'll stab you and shoot you over fucking dogs. Yeah. Because the dogs licked Lazarus's legs and they licked his whatever disease he had. I can't think about it right now. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, just same fucking. Uh, He's kind of built. I'm sure he was built. He was 90 pounds. <laughs> he was a fucking bone and muscle. You know what I'm saying? That was fucking it. No, it's, you know, Lee wants to start businesses. He's what kind a, of businesses? I'm not, that, that's the thing. Is we, we, we've been talking about it, and I have a few different ideas on going back and forth between, but then also part of me, if I'm being honest, is us. I would love to do this for as long as, it, as I possibly can, take whatever I make, go live in Vegas, and not deal with anybody anymore. I just play play cards. He wants to play and be a professional gambler. So I tell him that he got the books and he goes to gamble three, four days a week. Crazy. If that's what he wants who, to who, do. And stop who knows? Like I could around. always I could always do something. It's I never thought like what what you saying with all, with all the businesses you've done, I never thought I'd be here. Right. So I could I, in in six years I could be in Alabama doing something, who knows? But right now what makes me of, happy like that's that's when I I, I see you a lot on Instagram and like I'm, I'm, I hate. I really, di- I, I really don't like when people tell me, that, oh, it's work. It's not going to be fun. I, I really, I don't, I don't want to live my well, life you like that. Do something that's not fun. Yeah, I don't want. So I, I would pick the things you love, Lee. Right, and, and I love this, and, and and you know what? It's, it's a huge, it's a huge gamble. It's a huge risk, but that's, the most fun I had. Like when I, I was, I was thinking about it the other night. I was like, when do I actually have fun? Because Joey, Joey gets mad at me. He's like, I stay home. I don't. I don't like a lot of stuff. Twenty-eight years old. I don't like a lot, but what I like. And then moved this girlfriend, in, and now they really stay home to every night or week. Yeah. You know, she don't want to do nothing. She has to work at eight in the morning, so that puts him. And it's not like they can get away from each other. They got like one room. So I'm right. like, Lee, you got to get out of the fucking house. If not, you're gonna end up stabbing the motherfucker. And I, I, I love casinos. When people say they don't like Vegas, I don't get it. There's, I, I love everything about it. I even I've never smoked. I, was, I smoked one cigarette in my life in Jordan from a cab driver, but that's it. That's it. I love when people smoke at the tables. I love the smell of cigarettes. I love. I love. Drink, I love. I don't drink. I drink every time I go to the casino. I take two stars, two red stars, which does nothing to me, but it just calms me down a little bit, and I have the best time ever. If if I, the 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 thing I've actually started doing now though is I set a timer. Because I'll sit at the table all day because I love it. And that's when you lose your money. So I started setting like 30 minutes and 45 minute timers to see where I am and like take a break. But uh, yeah, that's if I, if I really sit down and think about it, I love everything about casinos. And I, I know most people hate it and it's, it's a lot of de- degenerates, but I, some of the best people that I meet and get to talk to and we're high fiving and, and telling stories. Is people at blackjack tables? It's I all. think that everybody should have a job and then a journey. You know, everybody has. Sure. It's like you don't want to be keep getting falling down. Now in five years, you'll be producing films. Yeah. The yeah, studios, I mean, that's the thing, yeah. Is the progression. There's right? studios in Santa Fe. In three years, you're gonna go. You know what? I don't want Keanu Reeves on bar me again. I'm done with this <laughs> shit. I'll fucking kick him in the stomach and end it from. Uh, you know what I'm saying? How many times can Keanu Reeves fucking choke me out? Fuck him. Yeah. So one day you go fuck this shit, and everybody evolves, man. But at the end of the day, it's a journey. I was telling you when you came in, you asked me, and I told you the fucking truth. And I always had natural aptitude. Right. And I can always make a buck. Like growing up, I always knew how to make a buck from fucking day one, I knew. So, you know, when I was 27, I was fucking frustrated. I was frustrated. Yeah. You know, I was making, before I got locked up the year and a half before I got locked, I was making anywhere from three to $7,000 a month. In those days, my rent was four fifty. I had four roommates in Boulder. You know what I'm saying? I'm making four, five thousand dollars a month, and I'm spending seven hundred a month at the house. The rest was on blow, yeah, dry cleaning, and booze. 
I would get high, and at 2 in the morning, I'd knock on the roommate's door and give her a stab and eat a pussy. <laughs> and then go back to my room like nothing happened. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the dream. <laughs> the but specter. I, you know, but it was so fucking weird how I started making that money. Like, I, I was making $800 a fucking month washing cars and they asked me to start selling cars and one day i went from the first day i sold cars i made a thousand dollars and i was i called the detail shop and i'm never coming back well you guys were paying me in a month i made in one fucking day every month after that was brand new subarus in boulder come on guy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. unless you're All retarded long. you're not gonna make yeah. fucking no money in fucking boulder you know i ran into one of the best salesmen ever today like we were just sitting out, I was taking those stupid pictures, but we were just sitting out there, and the guy from the Sprint store came out and was like, you know what would really make your your uh, pictures look really good? An iPhone 7S with, from Sprint. And then he started going. He's like, you know what? I can see your life is on your phone. Like He just started going at me and Joe Perez for like five but minutes. But he fucked up. Why? He ain't the best salesman in the world. Because me, I would have gone out there with the camera and taken pictures. Uh, don't bro see what i'm saying god damn it <laughs> see what i'm saying that's where the amateurs fucking fail and right there i would have had you outside with numbers what are you paying for that right now da, 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 da. let me do this have you seen the commercial right there you sell on your feet and your clothes on your ass you understand me i wouldn't have fucking told you that would have been work, work better i would have came out with the phone taking the fucking picture and then showed it to you and competed it to you and now i got you I got my hooks on you. Let's go in. Maybe you have a Sprint phone. I get you two phones for the price of one. It's Wednesday. Now I got you and Joe Perez all fucked up. My job as a salesman is to keep you fucked up. Yeah, keep you interested. Keep, keep you, you fucked up. I used to think as long as I could get it, like I used to sell roofs and uh, and like siding and shit. And uh, and we'd sell in, in Denver. We'd do storm sales. After storm, the storm, storm, yeah, storm sales, chases, yeah. yeah. I did and, the same uh, And I thing. go, man. If I'm sitting on their couch having a glass of water, I got a contract. And so that would be my only goal. I want to try to sell the I want to, I would just go, I'm just trying to get on that couch. If I can get welcomed in their home, make them feel comfortable, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Listen, uh, leave your card. We got your estimate. And we'll call you back in a week. And within three days, they call you back. Or sometimes that day, you leave with a fucking deposit. I love selling roofs it was fun man selling roofs was the something i did for about 18 months that was keeping me from shooting motherfuckers <laughs> okay it was my tail end couple of last months in the halfway house i got out of there but i was still on community corrections and i had two brother-in-laws that were you know they were like a, i hate to say this but they were like acclaimed roofers like, all day long, people would fucking come on the roof and go, listen, we got this roof over on Federal and this and this, and they knew it. They had been doing it for the same company since they were 16 years old. Yep. And now they were both in their fucking mid-30s, and they knew everything. I mean, our crew in those days, we did a a ballasted roof when uh -huh. you do rocks on it. Yep. But you have to, we would do 40 square a day, two roof tear up. Lay God, down insulation, damn. five of us. It was unheard of, but they were geniuses. They knew, like, 7 to 3.30. They didn't believe in overtime. And people go, how the fuck do you do this? Every day the rock came at 3. While we were doing stone, the, the, those two animals would be flashing. They didn't believe in overtime. They wouldn't pay it, and they wouldn't work it. Crazy. So everything they did was buy the fucking eyeball. It was the most brilliant toot, but they were socially. The one guy, they called him the Prowler because he wouldn't go home. Huh. My old brother-in-law, Tom, was a great guy, but I think he still has the record in Colorado for DUIs. Wow. Like 18 or something. Like somebody told me three years ago. I, talked, I still talk to one of the roofers I was partners with, and he goes, yeah. And the other guy was genius material but had no social skills. Right. But he would go on a roof. He would buy a quarter pound of weed and smoke it in a week, because he would roll. He would bring a bong in his jacket in the winter. We would do it. <laughs> so it was the craziest thing I ever saw. My and my ex brother in laws. My ex brother in laws were dynamite motherfuckers. You ever talked to any of them again? No. Or the ex or nothing like that. I called the ex two years ago. I had the baby. The baby was two years. 
you know, and I called the ex and I said, listen, this is what's going on, blah, 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 blah. You know, we're squared up. What do we need to do for me to talk to my daughter? She goes, uh, she's still upset about her grandfather and her and her boyfriend broke up. She'll call you in a few days. That was two years ago. Yeah. I called her back, asked her again, didn't uh, have an yeah. answer. So I'm still on the fence on that decision. Um, you know, I mean, I don't talk to my ex anything. So, I mean, nothing. That relationship ended 20 years ago right. when I almost got him thrown off a roof in Jersey because the wife was busting, my ex-wife was busting my balls. So for me to flex my muscles, they were they were they they had a roofing company in Jersey, but they were using, like, non-union roofing. So I called a friend of mine to rough him up a little bit, go up on the roof and tell him, you got to take the fucking... That really decapitated me with the family. Like, there's one brother-in-law that he's from Jersey and he's tight. That motherfucker still hasn't friended me back on, <laughs> on Facebook. There's still a friend request sent uh, from like every year. Just he hanging says in no, the yeah, just hanging around there. I was, nope, uh, not today, motherfucking Joey. When I got out of that, when I got out of that marriage, it sent ripples through. And I feel bad because. Her parents are really nice people, and they're very good to me. So I, I think about them all the time. In fact, in uh, in that fucking movie, The Accountant, the, the the guy's name was Ray King. Oh yeah, that was his name, Ray King. They were very good to me, man. So I always feel guilty about that. I still have my anger issues about the ex-wife right. because there's some issues that people have with them, and there's some issues that people have. Right. I was raised not to let somebody have the better half of you you know she pretty much yanked that kid from me <coughs> what have i done you know what i'm saying sure. Where 20 years ago they would have been in a fucking hole but my yeah. goal to be honest with you, was to come out of here and if shit didn't work out on the way back east i was going to stop over there and stab them both i mean that was the plan at that point if you're going to go go deep hey, <laughs> we've all i hope we've all learned something from pablo escobar he blew up a plane okay yeah. you want to fuck with me i'll blow up a fucking plane but look so, what happened to him and you're still here yeah but uh the the situation was that's how angry i was i'm not sure. that angry no more you know what, man? Uh, who knows what would happen between me and my daughter now? Who the fuck knows? You know, who the fuck knows? It's been God knows since I talked to her. There's some stuff, man. It's like that's the thing. Is like that's either a stopping point or a starting point. And I was talking to a friend last night and like uh, talking about like, oh, do you ever still be like ashamed of the ways that you've been or ways of being or et cetera, et cetera? And I go, I go, I go, no, I go, but. You know, there's there's some stuff that you just got to live with. There's some stuff you can't make better. You can just be more available, be better suited to be helpful if you could be helpful. But there's some shit that fucking you're penitent. Like that that whole thing. I go, you know, you're not you're not punished for the sin at at some certain fucking date. There ain't no judgment day, man. You're punished by the sin right now by doing it. When your awareness pops and your consciousness rises, you're at a point where. The thing tortures you, and that's why you don't act those ways. And like, and and some stuff you just got to swallow, and you got to live with it. And and then and then I think you know I think the same thing. You just be available. I tell myself six days a week that I'm gonna swallow it and live with this. But my DNA will never allow it. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like Nietzsche said, a man without a plan is not a man. I'm in no danger of dying in a prison, nor do I want to. I have finally normalized my life this November. I did the biggest goal of my life because I thought I got off that white fucking devil. Yeah. Something I did for 37 of my 54 fucking years and did it well and did it constantly and did it with no, I didn't give a fuck. Yeah. That's what I want, you know. When I got You're one of those, I only know a couple guys like you, like maybe two that they go so deep with the powder that there ain't no skinny fat. Like, that they're the heaviest dudes that I'd known, at, like weight-wise, like poundage, like 400 pounders. And they would do coke, they would eat a plate of spaghetti, and I was like, I don't, like, I'm I'm watching something that I think is physically impossible. And you're one of those guys, man. Like, it's like, I can never and, do and, coke and, and eat, but. The metabolism changes my, to where you can oh. keep the weight come on and be doing powder at the same time by the boatload. I didn't do powder in the, my, 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 
the, the, the thing that saved me for years was I was never a daytime guy. Huh. I was not a daytime guy. I wasn't a bumper all day. Somebody had that wrong right. idea. Those are like about salesmen me. or something, right? Those are New Year. Those are car salesmen and shit. Yeah. If if in thirty seven years, okay, in thirty seven years, if I did coke twenty five times in the daytime, it was it meant that I couldn't wait. Like I was the type of person that it and uh, it meant it was going all night. Oh yeah, then if if it went from the night before, that's something complete. That right, don't right, count. Right, right. I'm talking about. I I worked with guys like Rob Daniel. I worked with this guy that would get into work with a lunchbox, with bags under his eyes. He would sleep all night, but from seven to four, when he was doing construction, it was straight on. It was something that I had never seen before. Right. You know, it was like in the seventies when you'd watch TV, and I came to your office. First thing you did, without even asking, offer. was turn around. No, you didn't offer. You put two ice cubes in the glass, you poured, and you gave it to me. There was no offer. Right. And I didn't say, no, not today. I drank the fucking thing. You know, I knew people that were doing coke all day long. Number two, again, this is what I never understood. I started comedy July 18th of 1991, St. Patty's Day. 1992, I did a show with Troy Baxley. And to be the cool MC, I brought a gram of blow. Didn't work out for me. Never did blow and went on stage. I did blow the night before and went on stage. Now, if you do blow three nights in a row and you go on stage, you're not going to be you. Big difference. But I never sat in the comedy store and went <laughs> and got on stage. Right. That never happened because there's no... You'd wait to get a package after or something. The package would be in my pocket burning a hole in that motherfucker. Yeah. If you don't remember... That in between the room, go. the green room with Joe Rogan, that in between, I couldn't wait till the second show started. Yeah. Because I would bring Joe up and I wouldn't even say goodbye to you motherfuckers. Yep, bye. It's not even, no, there was yeah. no goodbye. Where'd Joey go? Yeah. And then you guys would text me, page me, and there was no calling nobody back. Not once got a text back. Not, not once. Nothing. Not, not, nothing. Ever. You're in no danger. Never. When I was snorting and I was on my You'd way. Like, well, home. maybe we'll see him on the plane, I yeah. guess, on the way back. Yeah, he would knock on the door on the way down. Joey, you coming? Yeah. And I'd be clean. Yep. I wouldn't be, you know, sometimes I'd stop snorting at two and we would get on the plane at like nine. Or something like that. I'd start snorting at 6 in the morning. We were getting on a plane at 11. There were those situations. But it was so weird how the... I was always a nighttime guy. At 8 o'clock on the way to the store, I would pick it up, put it in my pocket, my right top pocket. I would dingle. I would dangle. I would talk to you the whole time. I'd just be looking at you, but thinking, when is this right. motherfucker going to get out of my face? Right. So I could get on stage and do this fucking spot. Because once I do that spot, I'm coming right out here and I'm doing a line and I'm going to go into that bar and get a drink and that's the rest of my fucking night. Uh -huh. And guess what? Fucking Lee gave me the 40 he owed me. So I'm going to buy another two packages. I mean, that was my life, Tate. That was my life. Who am I kidding? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it was for me to think about November 8th of this year and think to myself, it was 10 years since I last did a line of Coke. Something that I would snort when I was when I first got into comedy. I made myself a deal. I said, if I'm gonna do this, the other thing I'm not gonna wrestle with is this cocaine decision. I'm not gonna do that, Tate. I did a year of that. <laughs> All right, guys, tonight's my last night of cocaine, guys. Right. This is it. No, and I wouldn't even snort with people at the end. I would say it to myself, "This is the last sure. night." I never did that. There was a day I looked at myself in the mirror and said. I'm a junkie. This is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do. I know I can't snort seven days a week, <clears throat> but I'm going to go. I'm going to give it the old Yankee try. I'm going for three nights, and that's what I did. I was very content doing coke three, four nights a week and sleeping three nights. I was very content because I knew that's what I was going to do. Yeah, I wasn't going to wrestle with it no more. The only time I wrestled with it was my last two years. That was the worst ever. That was the worst. When I knew it had to stop for many reasons. It had to stop for the comedy. It had to stop for my relationship. It had to stop for my heart. It had to stop for the sleep apnea. It just had to stop. There was no... Towards the end, the last maybe nine months, I was getting electroshocks in my spine in the middle of the night. That's when you know 
It's not good. Crazy. I'm talking <laughs> like just out of the blue. No shit. Yeah. No, 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 no. And then it started getting upper and higher and higher. And at one point, I started feeling electricity in my fucking neck. And I think it was two months after that. And a sharp pain right over here. Nobody would argue or you were healthy. Oh, no. Remember when that other head was growing over your shoulder? The fuck Ooh, was that? That was a, a fucking fat ball. <laughs> so you said that, it was too. A we fucking got fat the ball. same science today. It was a fat ball. That's all it was. Crazy. It was, a, it was a, fat, a ball of fat that wasn't tumor or cancer. It was just a ball. You, did you get it checked out ever? Yeah, I got it taken out. No, right? oh, okay, I didn't know. Got I, taken out, yeah. I, I, I didn't know. know if it just went away on what its own accord. What happens is when or, you have or, sleep apnea, your body goes into shock at night when you can't breathe. So all this cortisol is released into your body at night. And that's why when you see people over 300 pounds, 350, right. there's a point where you could go up to them. You don't even need to be a neurosurgeon or a doctor. At that point, you go up to them, tap them on the back and go, you got about six months before the stroke happens, and it's all downhill after that. It's a life of misery. You get that fat developing around this region. You see it a lot of people in the Midwest. When you go to Texas, you see big guys, but they have a little ball. That's where the that thing Cortisol. gets compacted. When you see people and they got oh, that hunch on their back, once that hunch starts coming and they're about 360, they definitely got sleep apnea. That's why they got the hunch, the hump, because the, the cortisol develops right there. And that's why when you see people over 400 pounds, that 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 fucking slunching that's just a ball of cortisol and to really separate that you got to stop putting your body into this danger it's got to be you know every time you choke at night your body's in fucking danger so you think that curing your sleep apnea that settled out a lot of stuff well when you don't sleep you know people think you don't ever recover there's no Bro, i only slept four hours last night for the last 20 you don't recover you don't recover. So not only does it throw off your glands and all, but it throws off your metabolism. Right. So you don't burn off as much fat. Uh, in April or March of two thousand of night of two thousand, a friend of mine got a deal, and I got an audition for a mobster, and I had no money, and I contacted him, and I said, "Listen, I'm going to bind." I got a great opportunity for a commercial, but I don't have a suit to wear. And he took me and bought me three suits in March of 2000. Beautiful suits, tailored. Because he used thing. to be a suit guy. He used to that was your thing. No, no, I'm a mobster. I'm a mobster. I don't want you know. You got to wear different looks when you go for a commercial and you go for a mob commercial. You got to wear a white shirt. But when you go for a movie or a TV show and you're a mobster, you go wear any other color shirt. There was different things. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story, Tate, was, and I, I, again, you're my brother. In March, he bought me three suits. In May, tailored suit. Tailored suit, all three pants. No, Nobody takes this to the laundry. Right. I gained such an amount of weight that in May... They were three inches away. Wow. Like, I, and I was so embarrassed to take him back to the tailor because he was going to go, what happened? There was a point where I went from zero to 60. Like, I went from lurking at 285 to 360. Crazy. Like, just a month, six weeks, 360. At that point in my life, I was doing coke four or five nights a week. I was smoking cigarettes. Yeah, I was drinking sodas, and there was no sleep. The sleep apnea wouldn't let me sleep. The fear had intimidated me so much that I would take five or six. I started with four Tylenol PMs, and let's say I would lay down at twelve fifteen. By one fifteen, the sleep apnea would wake me up, and I would just stay up the rest of the night. Fuck. On those Tylenol PMs, I'd go call for a gram of blow, eat some anxiety medication. Fuck. Oh yeah. My wife, you come over and talk to my torture. wife. You tell my wife. One of the first things I had to do was pay for a carpet in that first apartment because I kept falling asleep at night with cigarettes in my hand. My wife would wake up every night kicking a cigarette, turning it off in the carpet. The whole carpet was filled with cigarette burns. You thought a junkie lived there. He did, but not a heroin junkie. 
I was a coke junkie that could not sleep at night right. from the town hall PMs. So I would nod out and then wake up. Whoa. And in those days, Tate, I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And then I'd buy three packs of Camel Lights at night. And I wouldn't go to bed till those three packs of Camel Lights were gone. Holy fuck. Oh, we could. When you saw that f picture at the. I remember during the longest show when I met you, you brought me oxygen to put in my sleep apnea machine. That the doctor would come in every day and we'd have to force the documentation because the producers told them if my blood pressure was ever high than a certain amount, I wasn't allowed to fucking be in that movie. So that guy would sit with me for an hour every day, that poor. Uh, do you remember that guy? Yeah. And that's how bad a shape I was in during the longest yard. Dude, I met you. I was like, he might die this evening. I mean, you're over there. You're at, I remember the first time we were talking. You're on a picnic table. You're rapping fucking Ready to Die or something. And uh, you're rapping a whole album. And uh, and then that, who played that tranny? Was over there. Tracy Morgan was Tracy with me in Morgan the beginning. Was, yeah, the whole Tracy time. Morgan. He followed me like a savage. <laughs> I had him tip top with <laughs> That was awesome, man. And then, like, you and Heather brought me the chlorogen and stuff. The oxygen. And I started putting that because it was a high altitude. I was a mess. 90 man. degrees, fucking 100 degrees, 7,000 feet altitude. We. An easy 350. At that time, 390. Yeah. By the time the movie wrapped, I was about 415. Those pastrami sandwiches were a motherfucker. Once we got up here, they were a motherfucker. That was uh, not very good. Dude. No, man. Dude, I remember going to the YMCA, getting on the scale. They gave you a free evaluation when you joined. And the guy put the scale on 0.5, and I couldn't do two minutes. Treadmill. On the treadmill. I couldn't walk two minutes on the treadmill. The guy told me I had to go get in shape outside. He goes, I, he goes, how do you live? You can't even breathe. It's a brighter day, man. It's a brighter day. We're very lucky. So it's going to be 10 years. That's, and far as I'm concerned, I've been sober for 10 years. I've done more in 10 years than I did in 37. Isn't that amazing? Like, the, like That's what always trips me out when I look at like, doing what seems like the hard thing or the frustrating thing, and I'm like, well, my life rocketed after that. You know and what I you mean? you always knew it. Fuck. You always knew it yeah. while you had that syringe in your arm or that line of coke, Ugh. or you were taking that pill. You always knew that your Or like life you said, just different. sit down and write. You know, when you just finally do it and sit down, and you're like, oh, beauty comes out of this pen. It was something that it was like a li living in a fucking living hell. Like... I made a decision when I was 16 or 17. I wanted to do coke. And somebody said, okay, you want to do coke? I'm going to give you fucking coke. Yeah. Because I couldn't get away from it, Tate. Like, there was five years there where everywhere, I, like, if Tate said to me, are you coming to New Mexico? Stay at my friend Eddie's house. Okay. Eddie's cool as shit, but guess what his roommate did for a good job? So blow. That was my life. I could bump into cocaine on Mars. Yep. I was one of those guys. Not heroin, yep. not speed. I could find cocaine fucking anywhere within two minutes. Anywhere I moved, there was a cocaine dealer somewhere around there. Yeah. That was, I, I always knew it. One time I actually moved with a guy before I got sentenced. The guy, when I left that apartment where I got picked up, I moved with a roommate. And I noticed I'm sitting there one day and, and people coming over is out. Well, yeah, Joey, this is Tate. How you doing? Tate's profile. Oh, how you doing? All of a sudden, 15 minutes later, another guy would come over. And then that night, I go up to my room, and I come back at 10, and two people had just left. And then I would wake up at 3 to drink water, and he'd be up downstairs. <laughs> you know? And after about a week, I figured out, oh, my God, this guy sells fucking blow. So I'm about to get sentenced for doing blow. Right. And I move in with a drug dealer that's from my neighborhood, just 20 years old. I went to the Vietnam War. And it got to the point where every night I would watch him watching TV, and I would open up his closet, and I'd go in his jacket pocket, and I'd take out the ounce he would bring up only, and I'd take a rock out, put it back in his pocket. That's how easy it got. Like, this could only happen to me. Like, this could only happen to me. Not only do I move in with a drug dealer, but I know where his stash is. Right. That was the little stash. Yeah. His big stash was in the garage in paint cans. 
That's where he would put the kilos and break them up into four different paint cans. But he would do that coat. He was a freebaser. So this is where it gets even worse. I would monitor him completely. Like I knew when the guy came with the package, I knew when the cash was going out. Because the cash, it was all run through a bodybuilding gym in Acapulco, Mexico. Oh my God, you have no idea. Crazy. So this guy, his father was a doctor, physical trainer, blah, 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 blah. And supposedly he would come up here with prescriptions and things. Right. But hidden in those prescriptions was 20 kilos of blow. And he would do that every fucking month, except wow. for the summer months, because that's when that part of Mexico would be busy or the winter months. So for six months, he would ship him, like, what do you get rid of a month? A kilo. Okay, so every month I'm going to give you two kilos. You don't have to pay me for one. But then once comes uh, November, you're not going to send me until June. Right. So when I come back, you better have my money for the six kilos. So there was a time when I'd be living upstairs and downstairs, there'd be six kilos. Fucking wild. So then I would watch him. And I'd, I'd hear him freebasing. By this time, the cat was out of the bag. I knew what he did. I kept playing it off like I didn't do coke. Like I did coke once in a while. He thought I was like an athlete, blah, 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 right. blah, blah, blah. So I would wait for him to start freebasing. He would go through that whole bag. So I would listen for him. I would get up at like six in the morning and if I would go on his jacket, Damn. the jacket pocket was empty. That means he had gone through that bag and he broke into the kilo. So I would, my car was out in front of the garage. So I would come down, open up the garage. He'd be in there freebasing. And I'd find the can because the can would be sloppy. And I'd open up that can. And at this point, I'd just stick my God hand in. Damn. And I'd just pull out a fucking boulder. And I'd take it with me and I'd break it up at the Hertz place. And I'd sell it. And that's how I was making a living by taking this fucking blow. Disgusting. And stealing it and snorting it. But I would come home that night. And he'd be there all depressed. And I go, what happened? He go, I went on a two bender. I went on a two day bender. How am I gonna get this money? And I go, what are you talking about? And he go, I did about an ounce and a half of coke. He didn't do an ounce and a half of coke. He right. did a half ounce. I right. took an ounce with me. Yeah. He was so fucked up that he didn't know. Yeah. I mean, it was. But this could only happen to me. This shit. Jesus. Like these are the shit that was happening everywhere to me. Like anywhere I turned to. Yeah. Blow was right. I think it's there. that vibration. Yes, it is. You put out a cocaine vibration. Yeah. You know, you put yes, out a good vibration. Yes, you put out a is. sex vibration. You put out like whatever the thing is that resonates in you the most, man. That shit draws to you. And let me tell you something. That's it's, true. It's like nobody ever came to me and asked me if I want to do heroin. Right. When you do heroin, the universe makes you bump into heroin, people. Yep. When you do meth, yeah, I've had people ask me if I want to do meth. In fact, I bought meth a couple times because I couldn't find coke. Yeah. But it, that was what, till today, gets me weird. Here's the thing that killed me about cocaine. Sissy, the cat that died last year, we had it for 10 years. The first seven years she was around, I did coke. She wouldn't even have contact with me. A week after I stopped doing coke, she became my favorite cat of all. I couldn't get her off me. That cocaine energy, she felt it as a cat. Mm -hmm. And she stopped fucking with me. So the moral of the story is, Cats, no. If you're doing fucking tootsaloots, stop doing tootsaloots. That's the fucking moral of the story right there. I'm happy you motherfuckers Dang. got together here. Yeah, that's it. Hey, listen. And people know, whatever you're doing, when you're drunk on alcohol and you're fucking in a hole, you know what the answer is. We all know it, bro. Sure. You know, today, everybody... And what's it's the nice name? too, because there's so much help around. There's so many fucking... I mean... Tate, me Find and you your been, answers when you want them. Me and you been down a me and you were down a great fucking road. If somebody pulled up to us with the fucking hand of life, we still turn them down. <laughs> it wasn't until we made our decision yeah. that our lives changed. We got help. You know what a dude told me once? I go, man, I'd love to have uh, all all the gifts you got, guy. I fucking love. And he goes, he goes, fuck that kid. He goes, your gifts are going to be better because they're going to be yours, and that is the thing, man. Don't don't ever don't ever want for anybody else's life, man. Yours is the one that fits. Lee, what'd you think of the massage from Zeal? You got it 
couple days what for Valentine's Day. Yeah, uh, the weekend the weekend of Valentine's Day, I had it was my first massage ever. I had never had one, and I was I was I was a little nervous. And they sent two of them. To, yeah, we got a couple massages. One for massage, you, yeah. one for your wife. That was tremendous. And would you do it again? I would do it immediately. I would do it. It, it was a uh, it was a great experience. I I have never I've never been to a spa, but I I really enjoyed having them come to my place. I enjoyed any any you know, want to know why the the main reason. I was in, I was so relaxed and so calm after the massage. The thought of getting in my car and driving yeah. thirty minutes after that, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do that. So they do whole service. They do like service to your house. They come to your house. house that's that, so and, fucking another, tremendous. That's another so big nice. thing which they mention, which I think would be great, is a hotel. That's a big. That's what I think would be really great. I, I loved having it at my place, but my place is an apartment. So a couple of times I'd hear some people outside. But if I was in like a nice hotel, that like a little set back, the room's a little set back, have them come right to your thing. You get sheets from the concierge, or they can bring sheets. They have. They had music. They had oil. Uh, this. Uh, we had two of them. One was a little bit younger. One was a, a little bit older. I had the older one, and so there's something about me like. I, I judge people by their if their hands are warm. She had the most warm, loving. It was it was the best hour I've ever had. That's awesome. Yeah. You know what the best thing about that is? Everybody loves massages, but nobody gets them. Why? Because either the spa's closed or you're booked when you want one. Or trying to get there and sitting in traffic just destroys your day. Well, introducing Zeal, where you can book a five-star top quality massage at a time that works for you in the most convenient place of all. Your house, who's better than you? Whether your back hurts or you're running after the kids or your muscles are sore, Zeal brings you the same day in-home massages with the best license and massage therapist right to your home. Think again, an in-home massage is something only available to the rich and famous. Think again, Zeal is the perfect solution for anyone who wants a high-quality massage in the convenience of their own home. If you want a good massage, but you don't have the time to get one, have the massage come to you with zeal. You pick at the time, the location, and have your next massage on demand at home. You understand me? Just go to zeal.com or on zeal's iPhone or Android app. That's zeal, spelled Z-E-E-L.com, and select your top local licensed and pre-screened massage therapist. Choose your favorite technique, gender preference, time, and location of your massage. Zeal will send one of the 8,000 licensed massage therapists with a massage table, music, and supplies to give you a five-star massage. Schedule, booking, payment is fast and easy. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, a Zeal massage therapist can be at your door in as little as an hour. Find out for yourself why Zeal has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Vogue, and on Good Morning America. Bring the spot to you and Zeal today. Really, today. They're on demand. You can have the best massage of your life in your home with Zeal today. To help you get started, our listeners get $25 off their first massage by using the promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, at checkout. That's Zeal, spelled Z-E-E-L dot com, and then make sure to click add promo code at checkout to use my code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H. Right now, go to Zeal.com or on Zeal's iPhone or Android app and get a special offer when you try Zeal today. Enter pro como Promo code CHURCH at checkout, and you get $25 off your first, your first in-home massage on demand. You understand me? Give it a shot. Number two, I've been telling you about these people for a long time. If you don't have one by now, shame on you. <laughs> Nobody wants to walk around with a fucked up looking asshole. Let's pretend you bump into somebody and they want to do the new style of the rusty trombone they're doing in fucking France right now. But your asshole stinks like 10 dead fucking farts. What are you going to do then? Nothing. You can't get that fucking rusty trombone. But now, with Tushy, 
you could get whatever you want done to your asshole. Let's pretend <laughs> next year. <laughs> it's a beautiful world we live in. <laughs> and, you're, <laughs> and you're asking why? <laughs> because Tushy's a bidet. Hello, oh, Tushy oh, bidets are back, bitches. Oh, you know what a bidet me. does for you? It washes out your little muffler. You And they're portable. Oh, you can snap them right to your house. You got a 60-day guarantee if something goes bad, but it won't because nobody's better than you. Nobody has better pep in their step and more confidence when your asshole is clean. You understand me? <laughs> some people have a car. Some people find confidence in different things. Me, myself, if my asshole smells good, I'm tut 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 tuts. I'm ready to fucking go. Now, also having a bidet cleans your muffler from fucking hemorrhoids. It prevents fucking shit growing down there. Plus, you can watch the back of your nutsack, and that's always fucking good right there. All right? Anytime your genitalia can be fresh and sparkly, you win. Go to HelloPushy.com right now. Press in. Church. C-H-U-R-C-H. Get 10% off. You understand me? And if you get two, you get free shipping. One for her bathroom and one for your bathroom. Some guys like to eat pussy fresh. If you do, get her a bidet. Me, I like to eat it after you run two miles. Not three. A little two-mile run, a little yoga. That monkey got some fucking wang to it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not two and a half. Speak to me, old toothless one. <laughs> Go to hellotushy.com right now and press in. Church. Get 10% off your order, you bad motherfuckers. I love you. We'll see you next week. And I want to thank Onnit.com right now. Go to Onnit right now and get yourself some of that hemp force protein, the cocoa, or get yourself some shroom tech, or get yourself some new mood. It's going to fucking help you out. Go to Onnit.com and press in. Church. Bam! C-H-U-R-C-H. Get 10% off. Deliver it to your house. Who's better than you? I want to thank Onnit. I want to thank Zeal, and I want to thank Tushy for fucking sponsoring the podcast tonight. But most importantly, I want to thank you guys. Do not forget, next week, start not next week, the week after that, March 16th, Baltimore. Magoobies, Baltimore, bitches. I'm coming back. Get that crack ready. Number two, <laughs> at the end of the month, I'm up in Nyack, New York, and Lebanon Live. 3-3 <sighs> three, three through April fucking 1st. Get your tickets now. I want to thank my main Tate Fletcher for coming out. Yeah, yeah. Drink the fucking coffee. Thank He's you. He's got like nine businesses. Go to his webpage. He'll tell you all yeah, about it. Yeah, check out my name, Tate Fletcher. Check out Pirate Life Podcast. Pirate Life Podcast. Or Caveman Coffee, yo. Or Caveman Coffee, yo. Bars, massage parlors. Tate's got it all. You understand? <laughs> He's got more jobs than a fucking Jamaican. I want to thank my main man, Lee Syatt. And we'll see you guys on the Lord's Day Sunday afternoon with a surprise guest. See you next week. Thank you for listening. Stay black, you bad motherfuckers. I'm like an immigrant. I got so many jobs. Please. If you don't have 10 jobs, you ain't dead.